Morning, everybody. Morning, morning. How are you? How are you? Good. We're going to do that one more time. How are you? Good. That's better. Um, welcome to your capstone presentations. Um, I know you're really excited about this, in part because I know you want to get it out of the way, because um, you've got papers to write and so on and so forth. But the truth is, this is a very important, um, I think, part of your career academically and lays the foundation in many ways for how to think, how to present, how to make arguments, persuasive arguments, um, as you sort of move through your life and career. One of the things that um, I think I've been met with frequently professionally is um, to take the things that I care about very deeply take the things that I that I for uh, for which I would like to advocate and try to make uh, not only persuasive arguments but actionable ones meaning what happens when I you know if you sit in front of a, a, a crowded room or sit across the table from someone and trying to make the case to a decision maker to a policymaker about how to move forward um, this is where it begins if you haven't done it already this is where it begins it begins here um in 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 taking all of what we've discussed this semester taking the culmination being the culmination of everything that you've done in the last four years here at hunter both in the classroom and outside this is the this is the the culmination of that um to be able to take this into the world and be able to um show folks whoever uh, whoever's sitting across the table from you, um, the kind of work that you've done, the way you've been trained, um, and the, the, the ability to um, make a difference in your world. Um, this is where it all starts. And for many of you has already started. Um, so I, I wish you all the, all the best of luck, not just in this presentation, but as you move, as you move beyond uh, this classroom, um, this auditorium. Before I go any further, Harold Holzer um, is the uh, director of uh, Roosevelt House, and um, thank you for being here, sir. Um, and uh, I want to thank also President Rab, who, um, with, without her leadership, we would not, we would not be here. And um, without her leadership, a lot of the work and the partnerships that we've uh, uh, created, um, the support that we've gotten for your studies here. Uh, would not be possible. So um, way, the way we're going to do this today, you do have um, a, a presentation order, right? So we're going to follow that. When you come up to the mic, um, you do not have to wear a mask. If, uh, if it's more comfortable for you to take it off, you're certainly uh, welcome to do so. We, um, it's best if we tightly keep this to seven minutes um, for your presentation. And then we can ask you questions. Uh, I can ask, your classmates could ask, how others um, can ask questions. But at tops, we would have 15 minutes tops for both presentation and questions. Um, if just as a reminder, your final papers are due on the weekend. Um, so any tweaks that you need to make um, based on the presentation today, based on questions that were asked, you know, do that. Um, obviously, I'm available to answer any questions, um, any, any any questions that you might have. Um, but again, this is a this is uh, this is a way for you to again be able to uh, start uh, the process of taking all that you've learned here and, and pushing it out into the world to be advocates, to be. Um, you know, to, 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 to be strong policy thinkers and decision makers. So without further ado, um, Annabella, you are first. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Annabella Pritchard. I am a senior here at Hunter College. I'm majoring in psychology and pursuing a certificate in public policy. And today I'm going to be talking about the role of alternative community programs in mental health crisis intervention. Uh, this is a topic that's personal to me as somebody who has struggled with mental health concerns myself and has had family members who have been in emergency situations. It's important to provide the support you need to be, uh, 
people need who are experiencing emergencies. Um, so I'd like to start off with this quote um, by Paul Former, who is the chair of the National Health Service of England, but this applies globally as well. When you're in a mental health crisis, you may become frustrated, frightened, and extremely distressed. Your behavior could be perceived as aggressive and threatening to others, but you desperately need support and compassion. Being held by police only makes things worse. So with instances of police-related violence continuing against vulnerable populations, it has become increasingly clear that we need to find ways to limit armed police responses to emergency 911 calls and protect those in need. Police are especially ill-equipped to deal with individuals with mental health concerns uh, because they lack the ability to treat this population with the compassion and the support that they need. Those from already vulnerable communities, such as uh, black or brown individuals or trans individuals with mental health concerns are especially subject to the dangers of a police response. Every year, 10 to 40% of total emergency calls to police involve persons with mental health concerns. And in 2016, 20 to 50% of fatal encounters with law enforcement involved an individual with a mental illness. There is a need, obviously, considering all of this, for alternative community-led programs that work with those in need rather than against them. So how do we do that? Crisis intervention teams are joint responses to mental health crises by multidisciplinary teams. This could include police, mental health providers, social workers, and hospital emergency service, or any combination of these people. These teams typically have three key features, including community collaboration, training for police, and accessibility to mental health services. These programs can take on different forms with different emphasis on one or more of these key characteristics. One of the primary models for crisis intervention nationally is what is called the crisis assistance helping out on the streets model. Uh, it was founded in Eugene, Oregon in 1989. And this program, uh, what it does basically is mobilizes two person teams consisting of a medic who could be a nurse, a paramedic or an EMT and a crisis worker who has substantial training and experience in the mental health field. These teams deal with a wide range of mental health crises, including conflict resolution, substance abuse, suicide threats, and others. And this program responds to about 22,000 of these calls annually. The staff of CAHOOTS are not law enforcement officers. They don't carry weapons. They use their training and uh, experience to find a nonviolent resolution of crisis situations through de-escalation and harm reduction techniques. So founded 31 years ago, it is used today as the primary model for the long-term success of community-led initiatives. So why are we talking about this now? Why is it on the public agenda? Following the Black Lives Matter protests of the summer of 2020, the defund movement shifted focus for many policymakers away from law enforcement and towards the implementation of community-driven initiatives. Over the past year, CIT, crisis intervention teams, pilot programs have emerged throughout the country. And many of these programs actually look quite different. While some focus more on reform and training for police, others are community driven, only sending mental health professionals and paramedics. Others send partnerships of law enforcement officers and mental health professionals, um, but they all look quite different. There's over 2,700 CIT programs in different communities nationally and more are being introduced every week. For example, in New York, the Be Heard program was introduced last June, um, and it functions similarly to CAHOOTS based off of that model. It sends paramedics teamed up with a mental health professional to certain calls. Um, so it's important to note that although these teams are taking the place of law enforcement, the funding for these teams currently does not come from law enforcement itself. It's coming from public health, the fire department and health and hospitals. So although it's being said that they're a defund, it's being kind of held up as this like defund, um, coming from the defund mo movement, it's not actually re reallocating those resources. So this graph demonstrates the amount of money that's saved by the CAHOOTS program annually. The darker green is the total budget of the Eugene, Oregon Police Department, and the lighter green is the total that's saved by the CAHOOTS program. The program itself has a budget of 2.1 million approximately and an average of 8.6 million, as you can see by this graph, 
in the city de police department was saved annually between 2014 and 2017 as a result of cahoots answering 17 percent of the eugene police department's overall call volume so that's about one in five calls being directed to this program so this is actually a major reason why these programs are so widespread right now because as they require an initial investment they're a more sustainable budgetary option and they're incentivizing in that way than that of traditional law enforcement and they're saving the department money, which is why they're not experiencing pushback. The new pilot programs are predicted to follow this model of sustainability in the long term. So they're not only budgetarily sustainable and appealing, they're also effective. Uh, on average, research has shown that they increase diversion from jails and prisons to mental health services by 11 to 22%. Relieve police workloads by 27% and reduce the likelihood of people with mental health concerns to be arrested by between 11 and 12%. So what I wanted to investigate with my research was two things. First, what should these programs really look like? What characteristics should we be focusing on when we create them? And what, what, if there's 2,700 programs, what should the defining characteristics of them be? And the second thing was how they should be implemented. Where should the funding really come from? So I looked at a number of these programs and analyzed the impacts of each, both positive and negative. And I found that the most successful and effective programs generally are community driven initiatives where they're only sending mental health professionals to the scene and paramedics teamed up with paramedics without the involvement of law enforcement in their construction or their operation. The two key characteristics here are community collaboration and accessibility to mental health programs. While training police for police can be helpful, uh, it tends to be inconsistent and doesn't stick with all officers and it doesn't change the systemic issue. So in terms of implementation, um, funding again is currently taken, taken from city or state public health. So that's fire department and hospitals. So as shown in the previous graph, the price of CIT programs compared with that save in law enforcement means that it wouldn't be infeasible to divert funding from law enforcement instead of public health, especially since these teams are taking on a role that was that was previously fulfilled uh, by police. So I would propose that in order to commit to the transition from police to courts community to fulfill the promise of defund, um, a portion of funding, if not all the funding for these programs should be reallocated from law enforcement, not just hospitals and the fire department. So in terms of future research and looking forward, we're in the beginning stages of these pilot programs. How can we make sure that they're supported and how will they evolve in the future? As these programs continue to be implemented nationwide, future research, research should consider all angles to make them as effective as they can be for their communities. There are certain drawbacks to even the most progressive of these programs. For example, right now, these teams only respond to what are deemed quote unquote nonviolent emergency calls. Even the presence of an undefined weapon could constitute a call being deemed as violent. And instead of mental health professionals who are trained in de escalation being sent to the scene, armed law enforcement will be sent instead. So, how do we define violent or having a weapon on the scene? That's one angle that is not being considered. So what else isn't being considered? These are the questions we should be thinking about if we want to make these programs as effective as they can be and create a safe and supportive structure for those in crisis. Thank you. And I'll be taking any questions. I have two. OK. Now, you may not be able to answer it, but just uh... Uh, that's right. Um, um, by the way, we are we are streaming this, so you have an audience beyond this uh, room. Just a reminder to everybody. Um, you may not be able to answer this, but just very quickly, um, you may have said this part already. In in the Oregon program or in, in in other programs that you've looked at, the individuals do they are they paired with a law enforcement officer when they go out generally, or not necessarily. Not necessarily. So some programs within the 2700 that exist nationally, 
do send pairs between law enforcement and mental health professionals. The Eugene program and the program in New York, um, the majority of them are just sending mental health professionals paired with paramedics. Mm. So it's EMT workers or nurses um, or other paramedics. And then secondly, um, any word uh, based on the, the graph that you showed about savings? Um, any word on where those savings go? Is it back into general revenue? Do they reinvest in other or similar programs? Um, as far as I know, they in, they stay invested in the police department. Um, so while the so while it's like a promise that these are kind of being held up as a result of the defund movement, um, saying that this is us shifting to community led initiatives, the funding isn't coming from law enforcement and the amount that's being saved is staying in law enforcement, mm -hmm. which is actually interesting because that's an incentive for law enforcement to like to support these programs mm -hmm. um, and to support these partnerships, be, uh, which is why it's not experiencing that many push that much push pushback. And they're still uh, and they're still being introduced like every month. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Casey Goldstein. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm a senior here at Hunter College, um, and I'm majoring in political science, and I am um, currently obtaining a certificate of public policy at Roosevelt House. Um, and my concentration is LGBTQ policy. Um, I'm a member of uh, CUNY's LGBTQ um, Advocacy Academy also. Um, today, I'm proposing um, the removal of gender markers from all government issued um, identity documents. So all of my statistics today come from the 2015 USTS, um, which is um, the largest study on transgender, the transgender population in the United States to date. Um, it has over 27,000 respondents and it's considered the gold standard for any kind of um, information regarding transgender people. Okay, so, um, uh, this graph um, like represents how many transgender people do not have correct um, identity documents. Um, it can be extremely time consuming, expensive and emotionally taxing um, to change gender markers, which results in the majority of transgender people not having any um, government ID documents that represent their correct gender. Um, only 12% of transgender people have all of their gender, doc uh, gender identity documents changed meaning that 88% of people have incongruent gender identity documents. Um, and part of the reason for this is because um, the state laws differ so widely. Um, so all of the colors in this map, the different colors, represent all of the different state laws um, that um, make it really difficult to navigate the process, especially if somebody is born in one state and lives in another. Um, so the states that are um, colored orange, those states require um, um, a person have undergone gender confirmation surgery in order to change their gender identity documents. Um, that type of surgery is extremely expensive um, and not everybody wants to have that. So um, it's extremely difficult to get any gender marker with your gender identity um, on it. Um, and because of these different states having different rules, it often leads to mismatched um, identity documents. Okay, so this is an example um, from uh, uh, the New York State DMV's website. Um, and this is just like um, one example of like microaggressions that transgender people can experience when getting their um, identity documents. I didn't have to take you guys to the DMV. So um, on the website, it says uh, proof of a sex change is a written statement, um, right? Sex change is considered like a very outdated term. It's considered offensive. Um, and it just kind of shows that DMV doesn't really um, is, isn't trying to change any standard or protect anybody by having that on their website. In addition, this information is outdated, um, which shows how confusing it can be to actually like go through the process of trying to change your gender on your gender identity document. So um, New York passed a law this year where in June, um, starting June next year, you no longer need a doctor's letter um, in order to change your gender identity on your driver's license. And um, if New York State like updated this information, I'm sure that a lot of people would just wait instead of having to sp like, like spend um, a money, the money on an expensive uh, doctor's visit um, rather than just wait to get it changed. Okay, so um, 
Transgender people are frequently discriminated against by medical professionals. And this is extremely harmful, especially when transgender people rely on um, these people to write them uh, letters to change their gender identity documents. Um, so the, uh, the vast majority of healthcare professionals are not qualified um, and not educated about transgender healthcare needs, and they may refuse to write qualified patients that um, should should receive these letters letters. Um, and medical costs are extremely expensive. Okay, so 32% of the people, the, um, transgender people that would like to change their gender markers um, said that they couldn't because they could not afford it. Um, and this shows the cost if somebody living that was living and um, was born in New York, if they wanted to change all of their identity documents. So that's passport, that's birth certificate, that's driver's license. It's free to change your social security card if anybody was wondering. <laughs> um, so um, it's $45, it's, it's $145 to uh, receive a passport with the gender marker corrected on it. Um, and for, for, for me, and I think for, for most people with insurance, a psychiatrist visit is $100, a birth certificate fee is $55, and then a driver, the driver's license document fee is $12.50. Um, um, this is um, also discriminatory, um, especially to transgender people. 29% um, of transgender people are living in poverty, which is more than twice the rate of the United States um, population. So even though this fee is when, um, $313 to change everything, that's a substantial amount of money if you're living in poverty. Additionally, um, black transgender people um, have uh, do not have health insurance as opposed to 12% of white transgender people. So this is also like affecting um, certain racial minorities much more than others. Um, so um, transgender people are frequently um, uh, harassed if they don't have um, gender markers that are correct with their um, gender identity document. Um, before I was legally allowed to change my gender marker, I had to present my identity documents to be hired for, uh, for a job. And due to the incongruence between the gender marker, my gender marker and appearance, I was basically forced out myself to my employer. My employer then proceeded to out me to the entire staff without my consent. And because of this, I was frequently harassed at work by my coworkers throughout my time with the company. So, um, and I, I was lucky to get hired. A lot of transgender people that, um, that show incongruent gender identity documents are asked to leave and are not hired. Okay, so my policy recommendations are to remove um, gender markers from all government identity documents. Um, gender markers were actually implemented initially as a way to um, prevent women from owning property. So it, it was a way to keep like a paper trail where if your um, gender marker on your uh, birth certificate was um, marked as female, you were essentially banned from owning property. So they are a misogynistic relic that only causes harm. And even though they weren't implemented with the idea to discriminate against transgender people, because this old policy has stayed around, they do discriminate against transgender people. Um, so the removal of gender markers from government identity documents would increase protections and reduce stressors from um, reduce stressors for transgender people in the United States, as well as removing discriminatory legal hurdles that are currently in place to make it difficult to change gender markers. Then question. Okay, I have to. Um, first of all, uh, well done, and, I'm, and thank you for um, adding the costs in, involved, because I do think that tells a, a really important story. Um, you mentioned the DMV and you took language from the DMV. Is there any evidence that that's in any other, any other government agencies? Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I, I, I'm sure I could spend 10 minutes looking and find a ton of stuff with that, yeah. I ask only because that um, trying to get that changed across government may be sort of a, a step, uh, an actionable step that um, that folks can take if they, you know, if they want to, um, you know, either remove that language or, or um, amend that language. So it's just not DMV, it, it might be government wide. So um, it, it's a, that's important to look at. So I just wanted to raise that. Um, and at the start, and I, you may have said it, and, I, and uh, if not, I'd ask you to, if you have, I'd ask you to restate it. If not, 
Um, I do think it's important to get this out there. How do you define correct and gender documents? Yeah, so that would be if somebody's um, gender identity is not associate uh, is not congruent with the gender identity that's on their um, birth certificate, driver's license, um, any kind of ID, um, right? Like I identify as male, and my and my um, birth certificate says female on it. So that would be a gender. Um, that would be an incongruence between the two. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, hi, my project is entitled Changing the Algorithm, Remodeling Social Media Platforms to Combat Fringe Movements. I am Sophia Lamsefer. I'm a senior pursuing a, a BA in biology with a concentration in behavioral neuroscience and a certificate in public policy. I'm a pre-med student, so that's what kind of introduced me to um, learning more about the anti-vax movement, which is what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so first I want to discuss uh, so, so social media and the circulation of misinformation and disinformation. I think if I'm going to use those terms, I kind of have to differentiate between the two. So misinformation refers to the false information that is spread regardless of intent to mislead, while disinformation refers to deliberately misleading or biased information, manipulative narrative or facts propaganda. So what we see is that the majority of fake news stories that are um, that are uh, propagated on social media platforms tend to be misinformation. Okay, so what is the role of social media in the spread of misinformation and disinformation? So what we do know is that over two thirds of adults in the United States get their news from social media and that 20% characterize themselves as using it frequently. So obviously this demonstrates that social media platforms do um, replace many news media outlets as a source of news information. Um, we see this turning point in the war against fake news uh, in the 2016 presidential election, where there was an, a significant uptick in fake news being circulated on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Um, and this drew a lot of scrutiny from the public because many believe that their candidate wasn't getting a fair shake in the election. Um, so they started to uh, wage this war against misinformation. So as a result of the backlash, uh, changes were made to the Facebook and Twitter algorithms, but these uh, changes made little effects and the sites remained a major promoter of user interaction with illegitimate new sites. Okay, so my policy aims to understand uh, what can be what policy can be formulated to require improvements to social media so that dangerous fringe movements do not gain momentum into full fledged movements. So the fringe movements that I chose to focus in on are QAnon and the anti-vax movement. So in order to uh, discuss these movements, we have to understand where they came from. I pulled this quote from a publication from a secure, uh, this nonpartisan group called Securing Democracy, and they were discussing the spread of QAnon actually to Europe. And they said essentially COVID-19 anti-vax narratives fit squarely into the QAnon playbook by playing on the distrust of authority. And I think this sums up perfectly the threat that these two movements currently have. So focusing in on where these movements came from, as I said, QAnon started as messages posted on, a, on 4chan um, by this person called Q Clearance Patriot, who claimed to be a Trump insider. And they state that there is a satanic cabal of pedophiles and cannibals consisting of prominent figures that are puppet masters controlling governments and the media. Um, so obviously based in quite a, a lot of mistruths. On the other hand, we have the anti-vax movement. Um, the anti-vax movement is by no means new. We've seen this going as far back as the polio vaccine, but due to the rapid development of the COVID-19 vaccine and persistent anti-vaccine misinformation, it's been allowed to flourish um, currently. So what do these two have in common? They both have had fatal consequences. As we know, a number of QAnon members were part of the January 6th insurrection, which led to the death of a person at the Capitol. And currently we're seeing this pandemic of the unvaccinated where 98% of people who um, are dying in ICUs from COVID are unvaccinated. Um, and this can be partially due to, to blame the anti-vax movement who've been peddling this, um, this, these theories that the vaccine is not safe and effective. And what's also most frightening is that we're seeing this increasing overlap of these two movements over time, um, which could potentially uh, demonstrate the result, the formation of one singular, very dangerous movement. Okay, so just to give you an effect of how this mis misinformation actually affects our daily lives, people are more anti-vaccine if they get their COVID news from Facebook rather than Fox News, um, which as you might know, Fox News is known for kind of peddling anti-vax theories. As you can see, Facebook is the second most visited site for COVID-19 information, second only to CNN. But what we do see is um, 
they have the second lowest vaccination rate among all news outlets, um, second only to Newsmax, which is a pretty far right news outlet. So Facebook has long uh, rejected this role of arbiter of free speech. They claim that they don't want to um, impact anyone's right to talk about whatever they want to talk about on social media, but perhaps their laissez-faire policy is actually disguised for protecting their profits. Um, so these events like the January 6th insurrection, the rampant COVID-19 anti-vax propaganda on the platform, and the emergence of a Facebook whistleblower has really brought scrutiny to the platform's internal movements. So how exactly has Facebook failed to regulate misinformation? So um, as we saw from the Facebook papers, which were basically um, thousands of documents, uh, thousands of internal documents released by the whistleblower Fran Francis Hogan, we saw that Facebook knew just how much misinformation was being spread on its platform, but they decided to totally ignore it. Um, Facebook employees brought these issues to the higher ups and they even came up with proposals on how to curb misinformation, but they were um, uh, disregarded and they were never given a reason why. Also, uh, a investigative news outlet, The uh, Intercept, released Facebook's secret blacklist of um, basically users that they consider to be the most dangerous on Facebook. And what they uh, found was that 70% of the highest threat level denotes Middle Eastern and South Asian terrorists. On the other hand, oops, sorry. On the other hand, um, hundreds of these right-wing militia groups, which some might say QAnon could be considered part of, are considered to be lower threat and they're treated much more leniently on the platform which adds to this uh, misinformation regarding QAnon. Okay, so my goal is to come up with a policy that targets misinformation and disinformation on social media platforms to ensure that these fringe movements remain fringe movements and they do not gain momentum into a, a full-fledged, significantly dangerous movement. So the first act aspect of my policy would be to place pressure on social media platforms to alter their al algorithms, regardless of its effect on profits. Um, it doesn't matter if Zuckerberg wants to say that uh, he wants to take a laissez-faire approach to encourage a freedom of discussion. It's at this point is more dangerous than it is beneficial. There has to be increased transparency and accountability and uh, Facebook has to make their rules. Facebook and other social media platforms have to make their rules and regulations public. Um, we shouldn't have to rely on investigative news outlets like the, the uh, Intercept to know what Facebook considered, how they tier their most dangerous users. And finally, there has to be invest investment in the form of project grants for specifically sponsoring media and digital literacy programs in schools and workplaces and or uh, independent nonpartisan fact-checking organizations. Um, one place we can model this aspect of the policy off of is in Finland, where they start uh, digital literacy programs in primary school. So that basically teaches kids um, what is considered misinformation and how do you find it online so you're not um, tricked, essentially. So I already think we're well on our way to on, the, on, a, on our path to implementation of this policy. Um, the 2016 presidential election uh, and Facebook's failed attempt to curb misinformation and Hogan's testimo testimony to uh, Congress and British Parliament has really placed a lot of pressure on um, the CEOs of these major social media platforms as seen by Mark Zuckerberg's pivot to meta that's happening now. Um, of course, a lot of research still must be conducted to determine a timeline for sufficient changes and identification of major sources of misinformation. Um, it's not gonna be easy simply to just uh, curb misinformation. There's a lot of different uh, outlets that they're coming from. And of course, one major obstacle is the backlash from conservative voices. Of course, there's gonna be concerns that the policy um, is suppressing voices on the right and that this is governmental censorship, uh, but there really just has to be an emphasis, emphasis on this being a bipartisan effort and um, communication that this isn't gonna target one political party or ideology more than the other, simply just eliminating misinformation. But hopefully with all this in mind, we can have a path to successful policy implementation and people can be certain in the fact that when they go on social media and they're reading news on Facebook, that they're not, they don't have to worry that they're reading fake news. Any questions? I'm the only one asking questions. Um, very good. Um, just a couple of quick things. Could you go back to slide 11? So I'll take a quick look at that again. Okay. I just wanted to take a look. I, I didn't catch a couple of things. Okay. Um, two other quick questions. Again, you may not 
have a definitive answer, but if you could hypothesize that, it'd be great also. Um, do you find that what do you find the U.S. context uh, in terms of trying to combat this misinformation? Do you do you see it being uh, less well easier in Europe? Is the best way to say it, best way to ask it. Yeah. yeah, I would say it's definitely easier in Europe, and I think first and foremost is because they support it more. Um, I don't think they have as much of this uh, strong backlash from a certain political party saying, I mean, I'm sure they do, but I know for a fact that um, when Francis Hogan test testified in front of British Parliament, it was met by a lot of praising and um, uh, concern for her safety, whereas here there was a lot more, um, well, you're going to take away our freedom of speech. So I definitely know that they have public support on their side. Um, in terms of implementing, I'm not necessarily sure if it's easier, but I think having public support is definitely a huge aspect of that. Okay. And in your recommendations, you talked about, um, I think the third policy recommendation mm -hmm. was to, could you restate that again? The third policy recommendation was to um, have investment in the form of project grants to uh, improve digital literacy in the workplace and schools, and also just to fund fact-checking organizations. Right, one of the things that you might uh, wanna look at is the way that that can be paired or tied to um, civics education broadly. I say that because there's a there's a uh, there are a number of um, schools across the country where they don't teach robust civics programs in um, in K well not K but elementary school or, right. or beyond. And maybe this is a component. Uh, what you're what you're talking about could be a component of large, larger civics um, instruction or curriculum. So just something to look at. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Hannah, and I decided I'm a senior at Hunter College. I'm majoring in political science, and I'm also pursuing the certificate. Um, I decided to look at maternal health care in the United States and addressing disparities in like coverage and racial disparities that may occur in outcomes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So trying to look at like the background of the problem, um, when it comes to the maternal health rate um, in the United States, the maternal mortality rate in the United States has been increasing over the past few decades. Um, there are racial uh, disparities that exist and one out of every three women in the United States experience uh, uh, interruption in coverage um, during, like before, during or after pregnancy. Um, one of the uh, issues is the maternal mortality rate, which are fatal cases that occur um, like either during pregnancy or within 42 uh, days or of the end of pregnancy. Um, and this could be related to causes or aggravated um, by the management of you know, the pregnancy or from incidental cases. And according to um, the World Health Organization, this uh, measure is kind of a ratio of, uh, per 100,000 births. And for the uh, discon discontinuous coverage. Um, this phenomenon has been called like a perinatal insurance churn because there's a cycling on and off between health insurance and um, looking at the postpartum um, period is especially prevalent because women who rely on different services, um, that's when they experience di disruptions and that's when their health could be um, at risk. So looking at some of the key figures in the United States, um, I think as of 20, 18 is one of the latest figures. 17.4% um, um, is the current rate in the United States and compared to other countries or um, developed countries in the United States is higher than others. Um, and about 52% of these deaths occur up to a year afterward. Um, and there is a racial disparity as black women and other women of color experience um, this rate about two to three times more uh, compared to other women. So some of the other questions, um, research questions I was looking at was how can we um, improve um, the health for mothers during this postpartum period and address uh, these racial disparities. And this may involve changing like the health insurance landscape. Um, there are many stakeholders involved and not just the patients, but these healthcare providers or professionals and state agencies and people who do um, research. So, my kind of like methodology was looking at uh, research and trends in 
uh, maternal health. So one of the studies I was looking at was from the women's health issues, um, which found that the adoption of Medicaid expansion is associated with a lower maternal mortality rate. Um, and research shows that states that um, did expand um, Medicaid, um, the, the rate de increased at a much l lower rate compared to states that didn't, suggesting that um, this expansion uh, does decrease the mortality rate. And there has been other studies, such as from the American Journal of Public Health, that saw that uh, Medicaid expansion um, saw a decrease in infant mortality rate, um, and it has saved lives. Also, one of the reasons I looked at Medicaid is because it is the single largest payer of maternity care in the United States, and it covers about 42% of births, and it does play a critical role as about, um, you know, like I said before, people could experience disruption in care. About 60% of these disruptions um, could cause 60% of these prenatal insurance disruptions include a period of uninsurance. Currently, the coverage is for about 60 days, and this is concerning given that a significant portion of these, um, these fatal cases occur in the postpartum period up to one year. This is a map of state, de state decisions of, uh, on Medicaid expansion. Um, and about half of all states have explored postpartum Medicaid during 2019 and 2020. Um, I believe as of November 19, 39 states in DC have adopted some sort of expansion and 12 states have not. Um, especially during COVID, there has been different types of expansions to cover um, services such as like telehealth services as there's been interruptions to care. And as you can see in some of these uh, southern states would make up the majority of those that have not expanded it, um, uh, people of color have been disproportionately impacted, experience higher uninsured rates. Um, and this could be improving to improve maternal health. News research is finding that uh, Medicaid coverage is the important part of the puzzle, especially to address these racial um, disparities that occur because of uh, disruptions in affordable coverage and care. And so by states rejecting this type of expansion, they could be missing an opportunity, uh, missing an opportunity to address these stark racial disparities in um, internal health. Okay. These are some of uh, efforts in New York State. Um, so maternal, there has been a maternal infant uh, community health collaboratives initiative. Um, this was something uh, a New York project that looked at specifically like obstetrics, um, and they work with hospitals to put evidence-based guidelines in place. Um, in 2018, they uh, introduced this task force on maternal mortality and to work on these despair, um, these racial outcomes. And the uh, City Department of Health also introduced a project um, called the Severe um, Maternal Morbidity Project to work on these issues as well. And there was a report that was released in 2020, in 2021 um, that included a list of recommendations. Um, New York State, we rank about 30 I think, in the country, so it's not the worst of, um, but it could be better. And so there's a bunch of projects that are going on, initiatives to, to research um, these problems and try to improve outcomes. Um, there are, are racial disparities that can occur. Um, one uh, concern has been provider bias that could lead to disparities in, disparities in healthcare. Um, there was a statistic from the New York Health uh, Foundation um, that said, you know, black New Yorkers were twice as more twice as likely as their white counterparts to have severe complications in birth, and about eight times as likely to die from these associated causes. Um, and research has also showed that coverage, you know, during this. Uh, pregnancy period um, can help, you know, improve the health of the mother and child. Um, overall, people of color are more likely to be uninsured and face other barriers to care. Um, there was another, uh, some other research I've looked at was the association between paid family leave and maternal mental health. So currently the United States has no federal paid family leave policy that's currently being um, discussed in Congress. So it is being, you know, paid attention to. Um, some, there has been research that shows this improves implementing a, a paid uh, or maternal family, uh, some sort of family leave package um, up to 12 weeks can improve 
the mental health of mothers, especially when it comes to symptoms like uh, postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, and also not just, just the mother, but the family as a whole. Research has found that access to paid family leave helps women re uh, remain in the workforce after giving birth. So my recommendations uh, kind of covered the four areas. So one was to improve healthcare access, including extending um, that postpartum period from the current 60 days to up to a year of what comes to Medicaid coverage. Um, another area was racial equity to increase the diversity of healthcare professionals um, in education. And one consideration could be implicit, implicit bias tra training as there could be implicit bias and um, that occurs and that could create a negative experience for, um, with patients and their healthcare pro providers. Um, the other one was the implementation of paid family leave. Uh, currently it's being discussed and I think now it's about four weeks, but if it, if it were to be increased back to 12 weeks, I think that would be a good thing for to impact the postpartum mental health of mothers. And another thing was data monitoring. Um, currently New York State does have you know, data warehouses to measure hospital performance and different quality measures. Um, I think more states should adopt this type of thing. Also standardizing data collection, looking at the maternal mortality review committees, which are communities that kind of develop uh, recommendations. Um, New York State did uh, uh, create one in 2019. Um, so this is something that should other states should consider. And uh, these review committees are one of the leading recommendations um, from, they could create recommendations and one of the leading recommendations that these MMRCs was to expand uh, Medicaid. And according to the American College of um, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, that was also another recommendation um, to expand coverage. It's also a leading recommendation among uh, state level health departments. Um, yeah. Hello, okay. Uh, would you say that New York's policy towards maternal health is more progressive than the rest of the countries? I, I think it is. I think the thing with the, especially like the maternal mortality review committee was introduced somewhat recently. So I think it, it is good that they're like introducing these different projects, but since it has been like somewhat recent, it's kind of hard to tell like how beneficial it has been, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and also there has been concerns, especially with the COVID, some New York State and New York City officials, they have introduced like new legislation, um, but it has kind of been disrupted because of COVID. Um, but I know that there, I think it is like still like the fact that they took these initiatives and made a task force and are dedicating like resources to re like research these issues are definitely like good. Um, just uh, real quick, did you, um, do you know if, go back to the, the slide with the um, national breakdown, please, yes. Um, I don't know if you've done this, but it might be interesting to control for urban areas, meaning, right, even within um, the, the states, with, the blue states, um, if there are um, similarities between the rural parts of those states and some of those the southern states that you're looking at, right? So, if you take the rural er the urban areas out, do do the rural parts of uh, of some of these other states mirror what we get what we get elsewhere in the country? I only ask that because maybe there is a rural urban divide even within states, and that might just be something to look at opportunity um, and. Also, con thinking about partisanship, it may not be, I mean, it, it could be relevant, right? Um, but um, the party makeup of the state legislatures and or um, state houses, go uh, uh, governorships in different states and what, how that impacts. Otherwise, very good. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, let me take this off. My name is Nastasia Radulov, and my topic today that I'll be looking at is analyzing the justification of civilian bombings 
and I'll be looking at the case study of the 1999 NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. So a little bit about me and why this topic is important to me. Um, I'm a political science major, a public policy certificate. Um, I'm pursuing my public policy certificate with a concentration in foreign policy and a sociology minor. This topic is particularly important to me because my mother um, lived in Serbia at the time of the bombing. Um, she was close to my age at 21. She had to leave college because of it. She never returned, so I'm very happy that I can be here pursuing my education and um, able to make a change in the system one day so nobody has to ever go through what my mother did ever again. So I have um, career aspirations in the field of diplomacy and international relations. And I plan to obtain my master's in public administration next year at Binghamton University, if all goes as planned. So introducing some background on the bombings. The operation was carried out in response to former president of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Slobodan Milosevic's ex excessive and disproportionate use of force in Kosovo, starting uh, March 24th in 1999. NATO carried out what they called an, a humanitarian military intervention against Yugoslavia and the people of Yugoslavia. So similar to other military interventions we have seen in the past under the names of war on terror, preventative war, civilians offer, suffer, often suffer the most um, during these interventions. So it was a 78 day um, airstrike. So about two and a half months of daily airstrikes, bombings. Uh, it was carried out without approval from the UN Security Council. Russia and China um, were not in support of the military intervention. So many consider this a violation of humanitarian law, including Human Rights Watch. So going into some of my research questions, I looked at a couple of different um, aspects of this intervention. So I asked the questions, was the 1999 bombing of Yugoslavia a violation of human rights? What made Operation Allied Force also, oh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the intervention was nicknamed Operation Allied Force. So what made Operation Allied Force an unjust execution of a humanitarian military intervention? Is civilian bombing a justifiable response as an intervention to a government's actions? And what precedent did this set for the future of humanitarian military interventions? So I wanted to look at some of the consequences of this intervention, looking at casualties and infrastructure damage. The Serbian government estimates that approximately 2,500 people died during the intervention and approximately 12,500 injured. Between 79 and 88 children were killed. And the infrastructure damage was very, um, was also immense. An estimated 25,000 houses and apartment buildings were destroyed along with 292 miles of roads, 373 miles of railways, and approximately 300 schools and libraries, 20 hospitals, and 90 historical monuments were also destroyed as repercussions of the bombing. This is a table I made that I included in my um, final paper. And it looks at some of the locations of some of the attacks, the date, and then the casualties and injuries that followed. Um, so included on the list is the Chinese embassy where three, where three Chinese nationals uh, were killed. This actually um, outraged Chinese people across the world. It led to a lot of protests. Um, as China was one of the UN Security Council members that um, was in opposition of the military intervention. Um, so it just shows that some of these um, some of these targets were clearly inhabited by civilians. Other targets included public buses, refugee camp, villages, and the Belgrade TV and radio station. So while NATO claimed that they would not be targeting civilians, the nature of the attacks proved, um, proved otherwise. 
I also looked at some of the impacts on health, on public health in particular. So depleted uranium was used in the bombings and it was, oh, sorry, was used in the bombings and there are se several um, linkages to cancer, birth defects, fertility rates that are being um, studied um, moving into today. So refineries and chemical plants were destroyed, which polluted some of the um, ecology of Serbia. And if you're looking at how this connects into present day on December 2nd of 2014, the UN um, adopted a resolution that stated UN member states should provide assistance to states affected by the use of arms and ammunitions containing depleted uranium, in particular in identifying and managing contaminated sites and material. So despite this encouragement from the UN, Serbia has not received any type of reparation or aid in addressing, in addressing the issues of depleted uranium on public health. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if this is a possibility for the future or if any changes could be made. Next, since my mother was, uh, did experience this bombing herself, I kind of interviewed her a little bit about it to get a personal, I guess, account. So my mother, Yelena Radulov, she told me a little bit about what happened. So she, told, she said, I will never forget the first time the air raid sirens went off. I was at my uncle's house, who was a major in the military. He called my aunt and said, in five minutes, the siren will go off. I want you all to go to the basement and prepare for the bombs. I ran home like my, li like my life depended on it, through the town while the sirens were going off. I brought my closest neighbors and family to our basement. We were hiding in there thinking this is the last day of our lives. It went on for months like that. So this topic is extremely close to my heart um, because my mother went through it. She's lucky to be alive and thankfully nobody in her family died during the attacks, but she'll not, she always tells me stories about this time in her life and um, it's really honestly incredible that she was able to get overcome this, um, I guess, horrible time. So according to the, to, um, the unanimous res resolution of the League of Nations Assembly on September 30th, 1938, the intentional bombing of civilian populations is illegal. Objectives aimed at from the air must be legitimate military objectives and must be identifiable. Any attack on legitimate military objectives must be carried out in such a way that civilian populations in the neighborhood are not bombed through negligence. So NATO essentially broke all three of these rules and principles, despite being laid out decades prior. Um, they were negligent in their bombings, and they did not try to avoid civilian populations. Um, so this just proves that um, NATO did not follow some of the laws that had already been, laws and recommendations that had already been established. Since we're here in Roosevelt House today, through my research, I found a quote that I thought really encapsulated my research. Um, so, on 1939, the president issued a statement to the governments of France, Germany, Italy, Poland, and Great Britain. He said, if resort is had to this form of inhuman barbarism during the period of the tragic conflagration with which the world is now confronted, which was the world is now confronted, hundreds of thousands of innocent human beings who have no responsibility for and who are not even remotely participating in the hostilities which have now broken out will lose their lives. Even though this statement was you know, presented decades prior to this event, I think it is still ever so relevant because I don't believe that civilians should be paying the price for what their governments have taken part in. So, had our world leaders forgot about this precedent that was set by um, FDR and other you know, leaders prior to them. I have several policy recommendations, but as we know, international law is difficult to implement and even more difficult to enforce. 
However, my policy recommendations include amending international policy regarding bombing doctrine and ensuring that civilians are always avoided as targets in compliance with the Human Rights Watch recommendations. Um, other options include reparations or ex gratia condolence payments to the to citizens that suffered during the bombings um, to account for the physical damage, the lives lost, and the hazards of depleted uranium that citizens suffer even today. I wanted to also bring in the fact that this is still happening today in different situations, in different countries around the world. We see it in the Middle East, and just this August, the Biden administration carried out an airstrike targeting a military vehicle that ended up being, that ended up actually having um, Ten, killing 10 civilians and seven children. So they were, not, they were negligent in their attack and um, did not make sure that it was actually a military vehicle. But I don't think negligence is an excuse for murdering innocent civilians. And unfortunately for the past 20 years, you could even say 100, 100 years, um, negligence has been the excuse. And I don't think this is a justifiable response. So another recommendation I have is just an official apology from NATO and the states that participated in the operation. Um, this is just a way to move on. And um, sorry, <laughs> this is just a way to acknowledge the event and prevent future situations like this from happening ever again. And then my main takeaway that I kind of wanted to leave off on is should innocent civilians suffer the consequences of their government government's actions? Um, we're still seeing this today. Civilians and innocent people are still suffering the major consequences. Um, people that often have no control over what is happening in their countries. So I think that we need to address how the role of innocent civilians play um, play out in these situations. So, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I love that you interviewed your mom. Yeah. And and you have the Roosevelt quote in there, uh, which is great. Um, I just actually just a quick question: Do I have any precedent on the reparations? as a policy prescription specifically to has, has it been done it's been so i mentioned in august um i mentioned that in august there was a kind of attack that yes. happened in afghanistan with the biden administration he did offer uh what they call the ex gratia payments to the families that suffered the loss on that day also the china the the, the three chinese nationals that died um during the bombings of the Chinese embassy, they were also offered a condolence payment, but just those three Chinese nationals, no, I don't it's think- It's just a one-off. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, I don't think there was anything offered to other people, other victims of the um, bombings. So it's interesting just the, the politics of that, how, uh, you know, but yeah, otherwise I don't really, I didn't really come across anything else. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Huh? <laughs> okay if you can answer this how do you this is from zoom how do you reconcile serbian how do you reconcile serbian conscription in the context of civilian targeting i.e what is considered a civilian target at a time when almost anyone can be conscripted as a military target on state whim how international law account, how should international law account for this? Do you understand the question? Um, you want me to read? I can read it again. Okay, okay. How do you reconcile Serbian conscription in the context of civilian targeting, i.e., i.e., what is considered a civilian target at a time when anyone can be conscripted as a military target on state whim? How should international law account for this? Well, I would consider a civilian target. I hope this is answering the question, but I would consider a civilian target any sort of 
building or, or you know, neighborhood where there's obviously civilians that are inhabiting it. So if you're, tar I think there's a big difference between targeting a military base versus targeting a hospital or, you know, a major bridge or a railway. So I think that's the way I looked at it. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, no, I but think that's, fair. Yeah, that's how I would define it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, everybody. I hope we are all doing well, um, despite the time that we are in. My name is Lauren Vanels. I am an English major with a public policy certificate and a rising registered nurse. So today we are going to be talking about breaking the school to prison pipeline. But before I get into it, I want to talk about why do I care about this topic. So while growing up within the public education system, I saw a lot of kids stray away from school and drop out. I also saw a lot of kids express aggressive behaviors, either physically and or verbally. And while growing up, I didn't understand why this happened. However, within my teenage years, it kind of clicked and I understood that kids need a strong foundation. And if not, they won't be able to regulate themselves and they'll reflect the worst part of themselves out into the world, which then um, we have certain responses such as zero, zero tolerance that negatively impact them. So before I get into it, I want to talk about some definitions because I'll be talking about these words a lot. So zero tolerance policies is a school discipline policy and practice that mandates predetermined consequences, typically severe, punitive, and expulsionary, such as out of school suspension and expulsion, detention. This is in response to specific types of student misbehavior, regardless of the context or rationale for the behavior. The second definition is the school to prison pipeline. This is a national trend in which schools funnel children out of the education system into the juvenile system. So background, how did we get to this moment in time? This began in 1971 with President Nixon who declared the war on drugs. This led to an increase of drug control agencies. It tripled the amount of incarcerations targeting black and Latino peoples. Also it forced also, it enforced zero tolerance policies. Because of this, we see zero tolerance policies trickling into schools, thus breaking the schooling system down. We see within the years of 1997 to 2007, there was a 38% increase of law enforcement. And now currently within the United States, there are 14 million students that are in schools with law enforcement, but with no counselors, nurses, social workers, and or psychologists. So um, here are some examples of zero tolerance policies and how it, is and how it has impacted our education system today. So within, 2015 Virginia, Caleb Moon Robinson, a sixth grader, was filed with a disorderly conduct charge after kicking a trash can over. In 2010, Queens, New York, Alexa Gonzalez, 12 years old, was arrested and detained for writing on her desk in Spanish, I love my friends, Abby and Faith, and Lex was here. In 2010, Texas, Lehan Adam, a 10 year old, was given detention for a week for giving a classmate a Jolly Rancher. In 2013, Massachusetts, an unidentified kindergartner, was given detention and suspended from using the school bus after bringing a quarter size Lego gun on the bus. And that is the exact Lego gun that the kindergartner brought on the bus. In 2014, Baltimore, a seven year old, chewed a toaster pastry. Oh, a seven, um, a seven year old chewed a toaster pastry into the shape of a gun and said bang bang. He received a two day suspension and that is the actual toaster pastry on the screen as well. In 2010, Houston jo Jonah Devlin, an eighth grader, 14 years old, was suspended for two days for wearing a rosary to school as it was considered gang involvement. And last but not least, 
oh, never mind, two more. Um, in 2013, Pennsylvania, a five-year-old told two of her friends she was going to shoot them with her Hello Kitty bubble gun. At first, it was considered a terroristic threat. She was ordered to undergo psychological evaluation. Eventually, this was dropped. Instead, they gave her two-day suspension and reclassified the situation as a threat to others. And that is the actual news, um, breaking news screenshot. And then last but not least, in 2014, New Jersey, a 13-year-old was suspended for twirling a pencil in math class as it was bothering one of his classmates. So now to go into some facts of the uneven representation of discipline from zero tolerance policies. Um, in 2000, African-American students made up 17% of the student population. However, they made up 34% of suspensions. In 2003, African-American students made up 16% of the youth population. However, they made up 45% of the juvenile arrests nationwide. In Florida alone, as of today, American students make up 16% of the student population. However, they make up 45% of arrests. Um, in 2018, one in seven homeless students were suspended compared to the one in 25 students overall. And overall, 8.6 students of children are identified as having disabilities. However, they make up 32% of the juvenile population. And these are all results of zero tolerance policies. So now some facts from the American Psychological Association about zero tolerance policies. So in 2006, the APA created a zero tolerance task force. This was a task force that went into schools to see the impacts of zero tolerance on its students. Um, and basically, overall, they examined that schools weren't any safer prior to the implementation of the zero tolerance policy. In fact, that they found, they found that severe punishment leads to the increase in behavior and dropout rates. They also found out that the policy doesn't increase discipline, but it increases disciplinary actions towards students that are temporarily withdrawn from school. And last but not least, evidence shows that zero tolerance policies increase referrals to the juvenile justice system. So I should have included this earlier in my slide, but my research question, I mean, my policy research question is, can the use of guidance over punishment break the school to prison pipeline? And I believe so. So my policy plan is a six step plan. So the first step is to erase zero tolerance policies from schools. The second step is to remove police officers within schools. The third policy is to increase the counselor to student ratio to 250, to 250 counselors per um, the national average is 424 counselors per one student. And the ratio of 250 to one is recommended by the APA. Um, the fourth step is to implement positive behavioral interventions and support. This, um, while doing my research, I found that there's this program that was created actually in 1998. Um, it is called the, Behav the Positive Behavioral Interventions and Support Program or known as PBIS. Um, it was created in 1998 by George Sugai and Rob Horner that were from, they were from the University of Oregon. Basically PBIS is a five-year funding cycle in which they provide schools with the materials they need in order to promote school safety and good behavior. Um, so they teach schools to teach kids about behavior expectations and strategies. They also teach schools about prevention and not punishment. Um, overall, when looking at the reports, we see that this led to better student behavior. And we also saw that it showed that students received less detention and suspension. So how can we make this happen? Let's look at the allocation of money. So when looking at the funding for the police within schools, it reaches millions of dollars. In 2018, six million dollars was allocated towards virginia 14 million towards south carolina 69 million in north carolina 75 million in tennessee 85 million in georgia 100 million in texas 
and 400 million in Florida. So when looking at um, my two steps within my plan, which is to increase guidance counselors and to implement the PBIS. PBIS implementation within one school alone is $9,266. So with $1 million alone, we can implement PBIS within 107 schools. And when looking at the average salary of a guidance counselor within the United States, it is some, it's around $75,000, meaning that Texas alone, um, mind you, Texas gets $100 million allocated for their police within schools. So that being said, with $100 million, um, schools can obtain up to 5,333 new guidance counselors. So the expected outcomes. Um, well, first and foremost, stu students will learn from the behaviors, from their behaviors and develop strategies on how to manage them. More students will graduate from school and less students will be suspended, expelled and or incarcerated. So why is this important? Well, first and foremost, equality matters. Every student deserves to have a good education. Um, well, education matters. Everybody deserves to understand and know how to express themselves. Um, and while doing my research, I found this quote and it stuck to me and it's by Thomas Reed. He wrote it within one of, one of his essays in 1786. And it says a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So how can we expect our society, this long chain to be strong when a big link, which is education is weak. And last but not least, our children are the future of this world. How can we expect our world to have a bright future when our children don't know how to manage themselves and to manage their behaviors? Um, and yes, thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, anybody else? I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I really liked your presentation. This is like working. Okay. Um, I was just like thinking about my own project as well about um, surveillance technology and obviously like we'll get into that. But in my research, I actually found um, like within research on the NYPD NYPD budget, like it, they will do funding for police officers in schools like they moved that funding to the Department of Education budget. Yep. So it makes it look like they're you know, like di diverting the funding of police in schools, but they're just moving it and kind of like strategically making it look like they're divesting, but they're not. So that was just something I had in mind. Uh, and not really a question, but I just wanted to say that. Well, thank you for adding that. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I would just add very quickly, if you haven't looked at it, um, you mentioned Nixon. It's also important to look at some history under Ronald Reagan. In the, With the No Child Left Behind? No, no, that's, no, that's it's, Bush. Um, I feel like I know where you're going with this, because I was going to include it, but no. um, the gun, the gun, um, no guns. Not exactly. It, it related, okay, but not exactly. Okay. So in the early 80s, um, the uh, Department of Education and part of a larger commission developed uh, a report called The Nation at Risk. And The Nation at Risk basically outlined where American schools were deficient. And it was a lot of sort of blaming the teacher, blaming. The teacher. So I don't want to necessarily get into the education policy pieces of it. But one of the things that Reagan was intentional about, and he made a speech about this, was um, he was they were they were very very focused on discipline in schools, um, and basic well not basically but very intentionally stated that his administration wanted to work with his office wanted to work with the Department of Justice to try to fix discipline in schools. So when you think about that. Why is the Federal Department of Justice involved in discipline in schools, right? And that is the 
I don't want to say that's the beginnings of it, but that is a very important uh, moment in this school to prison pipeline when you have the Federal Department of Justice like, involved in disciplining kids in schools. Yeah. Um, so just something to look at in your in your research or if you can make an ad about that in the final paper. Okay. All right, very Thank good. You. Thank you. Perhaps. Good morning. I hope it's not gonna take long because professor told me to add more in my presentation. Did I? Yes. Did I? <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Rahab. Um, I'm a French major. Uh, that's enough. <laughs> okay, this is uh, my problem, uh, defining problem. Um, my case is that the US media coverage uh, over dramatized negative news about COVID-19 pandemic and uh, its vaccination. Um, uh, the objective of this, um, that the, all US media outlets should provide a complete picture of the news related to COVID-19. And my solution is, as a couple of solution is going to uh, government authorities, also for the healthcare and for the individual. Um, so uh, my solution is that the um, government ought to monitor social media, uh, as well for the health authorities could dispel myths and answers people's uh, questions. Uh, also, people have to uh, be educated as to how to determine what reliable, reliable information in the media outlet is. My expected returns is to prevent the spread of negative emotion and panic among individuals due to false news, uh, also to ass uh, the assurance that mainstream media is reporting the truth regard regardless of their orientation or affiliation. And the most importantly is to promote public safety. Um, that's uh, the topics that I'm going to talk about. It's five. I hope I will go very quick with that. OK, the first um, point is the influence of uh, media outlets on COVID-19 vaccine acceptance in the United States. Um, uh, we know that media is a significant source of, me, uh, of information for us, but it, uh, it's focused on delivering information constantly rather than focusing on the news credibility. For example, uh, we have seen this uh, on the spread of COVID vaccine. Um, also, um, uh, as a vaccine become uh, widely available to the public, the news was divided between those who were anti-vax and those who were uh, pro-vax, resulting in the spread of misinformation, which caused public uh, to be hesitant about vaccination and refuse it altogether. I will start uh, explaining very quick about um, the reasons that citizens are hesitating um, like why they're not getting the vaccine. Um, <clears throat> vaccine refusal and hesitancy were always linked to concern about vaccine safety and uh, effectiveness, but most of these reasons stem from uh, mis and mistrust in healthcare system. Um, also, the reason for the vaccine varied by uh, social demographic groups. For example, um, those with the highest uh, prevalence are African American, 34%, uh, following by His Hispanics, 29%, individuals with low education and income, 31%, rural dualers, 29%, uh, po people in the northeastern of US, uh, 25%, and the Republicans, 29%. Uh, 
oh, sorry. Um, and the reasons that people are, why they're not getting vaccine is uh, vaccine, uh, they see vaccine as a threat. Um, also, uh, they're afraid of uh, the side effects of the vaccine. Um, lack of trust uh, in the vaccine and uh, the institutions. Also, uh, spread of conspiracy theories. Okay. Um, launching media campaign to promote COVID vaccine. Um, as a result, uh, the COVID, uh, the U.S. Uh, government has created a media campaign to promote the COVID vaccine and assure the public of its effectiveness. They used um, social media influencers to endorse uh, COVID vaccine by sharing the experience of the social media influencers like leaders or celebrities being vaccinated. It would uh, encourage the public about the vax and not feel pressure. For example, um, they made an Instagram celebrity host, Dr. Fauci, and ask him uh, some question that related to vaccine safety. And this uh, young lady, she's a uh, um, she's a public figure that specialized with fashion and makeup. Um, President Joe uh, Biden hosted her to the White House um, just to talk about the vaccine and how is it important to the community. Also, uh, using uh, professional support, uh, media coverage of doctors receiving vaccine uh, can improve public uh, confidence and health literacy, as well as diffusing public concerns by delivering the accurate vaccine information at a local and national levels. Uh, persuading community. Um, it's uh, very important to understand uh, the psychology of the public uh, attitude and behavior toward the vaccination. So um, interactive webinars, engagements, and events um, were held. Um, this could be um, like a online engagement, like Zoom or Microsoft Team or Skype. Uh, like what the CDC did um, on YouTube, uh, they host like a uh, information session um, around vaccine updates in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Or um, also stakeholders, there's interactive uh, webinars engagement and uh, stakeholders engagement events. Uh, they were also held to uh, address the critical uh, public health crisis resulting from the pandemic. Uh, the FDA engaged uh, patients, pharmacists, physicians, and healthcare professional organizations, in addition to other stakeholders. And there is an examples. Um, there's some examples of stakeholder engagement. Um, uh, first. Um, communication with doctors to understand what drugs healthcare providers uh, are using to manage COVID patients, or uh, they can um, discuss a drug shortage with, um, with an emergency uh, response organization and uh, to um, expedit information sharing on urgent topics like drug distribution. Okay. Number two, um, uh, how is like media frame uh, COVID-19? Framing language and word choice is effective to deliver the intended, intended uh, information. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, media outlets must keep people informed constantly. So when messages are delivered by the media, how they are delivered matters most. Um, so a message can be framed to emphasize a positive or negative intention, which could influence behavior based on the frame used. For example, um, 
The New York Times and NBS News are both using frames to convey messages about successful vaccine, which might increase vaccine use. Also, there is another example, uh, it's, which is um, a field study on Facebook has been conducted uh, in the US to investigate the effectiveness of pro-social ad messaging frames in promoting the dissemination of public health recommendation online. There is three types of ads here. Um, uh, in the ad, they highlighted the benefits of um, the benefit to oneself, which is protect yourself against COVID, and to a socially close one, which is protect your loved uh, your loved ones. Um, the third one is to so, uh, to socially distance other, which is protect your community, and the result. Um, is when pro-social framing was focused on distance social group, which is protect your community, the ad clicks rate on Facebook was the lowest compared to ad focused on protect yourself and protect your loved ones. And protect yourself, uh, protect your loved ones ad and yourself uh, were in the same rate. Okay. <clears throat> Number three, uh, information channels and uh, and the acceptance of COVID-19. Uh, people tend to accept more information delivered through traditional media during a pandemic and less information delivered through social media, which is more likely to convey uh, misinform misinformation and vaccine skepticism than traditional media. However, a survey conducted in December um, analyzed the number of people trusting vaccine information from different uh, media sources and the impact of these uh, media channels on vaccine effectiveness. Uh, which shows that uh, among those who use social media outlets, instead of traditional media, there was a relatively positive reaction uh, to the vaccine. On the other hand, um, uh, traditional media had a higher level of trust um, in COVID vaccine uh, information than social media. However, uh, vaccine acceptance level differs significantly by demographics factors such as genders, age, education, and the information received from like traditional or digital media. Um, uh, they found that female were more um, likely to get the vaccine compared to males, uh, 41% uh, percent, uh, versus 38%. Also, a higher proportion of those who knew someone who had died of COVID-19 uh, were very likely to get the vaccine. However, there was a statistically significant difference. A difference in vaccine acceptance between those who got information from traditional media alone, which is uh, 46%, and from social um, media alone, which is 29%, and from both um, 37%. I think I should have put this on the slide. Okay. Uh, in overall, uh, the traditional media source seems to increase the likelihood of vaccination. In contrast uh, to those who use social media as their primary source of information are less likely to receive the vaccine. Because we know um, social media has the ability and um, to control or craft uh, the messages easier than the traditional. Okay, um, number four, the use of uh, media outlets to convey information regarding uh, COVID vaccine. The question here is how the media present COVID vaccine news to the public. Um, a variety of media types and their wide range of application provided provides many opportunities for both positive and negative media contributions, providing a unique mix of um, media content. 
So I'll start with the social media, how vaccine um, content uh, in social media. Um, to increase um, in people turning, um, the increase uh, in people turning to social media uh, for vaccine information can impact the knowledge and the attitude uh, of users about vaccination, where social media users, um, social media allow users to follow or like other uh, users or group to stay tuned, allowing them to self-stem uh, streams of content re relevant to their interest while stimulously uh, rejecting content they don't like which might, um, may uh, allow individual to aggregate and cluster with ideology distinct sub-communities commonly known as eco um, Also, um, the discourse uh, on social media regarding vaccinations has evolved uh, during the pandemic with mixed sentiment and feelings about the facts. For example, um, there's a study um, on Twitter between March 7 and April 21, 2020, that examined the public discourse and emotion related to the COVID-19 pandemic by um, analyzing more than three, uh, 4 million tweets using a list of hashtags like uh, coronavirus, quarantine, face mask, uh, lockdown, Wuhan virus or Chinese virus. And uh, the sentiment um, analysis showed that tweet express, expressed mixed uh, feelings, anger, uh, trust, and sadness. But the most dominant tweets is 23% uh, expressed anti anticipation, which is uh, their necessary, um, uh, necessary steps to, um, sorry, necessary steps and progression will be taken and 18% um, expressed fear of the impact of the virus. Um, however, several studies have shown that non-human accounts generated to great deal of social media content on the subject of vaccination, including um, bots and trolls, and certain social media users, including those with cognitive impairment older age, uh, lower literacy, and less uh, digital literacy may be more susceptible to emotion appeals of social media posts based on their baseline personal values and bases. Moving to traditional media. According to the US National Survey, traditional media present conflicting news about COVID generally, for example, a majority of mainstream television news, for example, like um, NBC News, correlates with accurate information about the disease severity, while the majority uh, of mainstream print media, like New York Times, uh, correlate with an accurate belief about protection from infection. However, Fox News was also correlate with conspiracy theories, including the belief that some in the CDC, CDC were exaggerating the severity of the virus to discredit Donald Trump's presidency. Um, also, other study on Pew Research Center found that rating of media coverage of COVID-19 differs greatly based on main news source where 92% of those who follow NBC News as main source say the media has covered the pandemic well, comparing to CNN, 82%, and Fox, um, 56%. On the other hand, uh, Fox News was the higher rate um, of 79% of people who say Fox has exaggerated exact uh, news and see conflicting facts about COVID. Okay, um, analyzing the relationship between media exposure and information or misinformation based on ideology and political party. The COVID-19 pandemic 
uh, has been one of the trending topics on Twitter since January 2020 and has continued to be discussed to date. However, um, media is an important source of information and government officials uh, have been using Twitter to share policy updates and news related to COVID-19. But when the media spread inf information without proper verification, it can have unintended consequences. Um, for example, um, Trump's endorsement, Trump's endorsement uh, on Twitter of uh, chloroquine, it's a drug that fights certain uh, viruses, which is harmful to the public if not used uh, by doctor prescription. Um, in, the, in the weeks following the tweets from President Trump on March 19, 2020, the drugs um, uh, have been spread uh, or mentioned on social media widely. And after that, it got disappeared from the stock market and uh, uh, the prices went up. Um, also, the vendors are uh, starting to stocking up on it, which caused a shortage of this uh, drug. And in, that's and that's caused a problem to people who are using it for um, certain diseases. Okay, and consequent, consequence, uh, due to the media political views of COVID-19, it has become a political issue in the US and uh, this has a great effect on public opinion as we can see and um, generally Americans say the media have covered uh, the COVID outbreak well but there, is, there are significantly differences by party and ideology. However, um, Democrats were more worried than Republican about exposure to COVID-19 and thinking that the CDC has exaggerated the threat of coronavirus. 64% um, of the US adults say CDC mostly gets the facts um, about uh, the outbreak right, while 30% say the same thing about Trump um, and his administration. Um, also, um, there is a study here, like uh, as of March 20, 76% uh, of Americans who rely um, on Trump for COVID news are more likely to say the media has exaggerated risk. Yeah, compared um, with Democrats, 49%. And finally, the last point, digital health strategies to overcome vaccine misinformation on social media. There's uh, several strategies have been explored to improve the social media presence of the news and overcome the misinformation. In the first place, um, they suggested that healthcare uh, provide Providers should use social media platforms to improve communication with patients since they are among uh, the most trusted uh, sources of information by um, engaging social media platforms with balanced information, uh, acknowledging public concerns and avoid uh, scientific jargons. Number two, um, changing in the structure of social media that can help user, users to share accurate information. Many people share in misinformation about COVID because um, they fail to determine um, if, this, um, if this piece of information is correct or not, or whether they took it from a reliable source or not. They just share it, which is, um, which is fake news uh, can compromise to uh, two elements uh, intentionally, uh, which uh, these are the people who intended to harm uh, people with this uh, information they shared. Also, uh, falsity, um, those people who just share um, 
information they don't uh, know where they come from. Um, so the media platforms um, are making videos to combat uh, misinformation and providing links to reliable source with accurate news. For example, Facebook is attempting to reduce the disruption of anti-vaccine uh, anti content and provide um, authoritative information about vaccines on their networks, including Instagrams and Twitter uh, are, are um, attempting to link uh, vaccine-related keywords to vaccine.gov. Lastly, framing messages. Um, gain frame messages emphasize the benefit of adopting a recommendation behavior. On the other hand, losing frame messages emphasize the loses from not adopting a, a recommended behavior, which is um, very crucial to, um, to use the right method to deliver the messages um, so we can change behavioral the behavior of public. Okay, this is are my policies. Uh, you know, um, due to the small number of companies or owners who control the media outlets, it's easy for them to manipulate uh, the news coverage. So, um, like uh, large companies own the major network and TV station. For example, Rupert uh, Murdoch's Media uh, Corporation owns all the Fox channels, several radio network, cables, and television around the world. Also, he, um, he owns the Wall Street Journal and his family controls 120 newspapers across five countries. So, <clears throat> Uh, we know the First Amendment of the Constitution gives us the freedom of uh, speech and press, but unfortunately, um, the government have failed to restrict and control uh, the media somehow. So I made these policies. Um, I really like the policy that I sent you, but you said it's very, yes. <laughs> okay, it's about uh, that. Um, let me see here. Okay, you said it's very difficult that um, that the government can control over the media because I said most media networks should own um, by the government and media companies shall not own more than 40% of the media outlets, right? Okay. 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 So I made I changed it to these policies. Uh, government should regulate the moderation of social media platforms so that fairness, balance, and other values are achieved. Uh, number two, government should collaborate with tech firms, social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, the most influential ones to counter the spread of misinformation and hate speech. Also, um, to require the social media uh, to police their plat platform to enforce accepted public standard for speech, like uh, liability uh, for defamation and, and misinformation that will lead to public dispute. Uh, number three, um, since you know more people are uh, trusted trust traditional media um, than social media i thought that uh, the government sh should specialize um, a medical channel to share a scientist uh, scientific information and advice like in case of covid19 they could do that that's it Any questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what she's talking about, the we went back and forth on one of her recommendations, which was government ownership of 
news outlets, which I said <laughs> is sort of a non-starter here um, because of our uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech, and so on. But it actually dovetails into your presentation a bit because we could talk about regulation on the other side, right? Uh, how do you how do you regulate um, or whether it's on social media or are there any op other opportunities to regulate how certain information is um, portrayed in the media or who portrays that information? You know, trying to think through people who are on TV who are conflicted because of certain, um, you know, they may have contracts and things like that that aren't necessarily acknowledged. So there are ways that we can uh, uh, regulate certain things as without government ownership. So that was the back and forth that you referred to. But thank you very much. Okay. All right, we are at uh, 11 o'clock. We only have four more left. Why don't we take a five minute stretch, restroom, email, whatever you need to do. We'll come back at five after and keep going. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for all being here. Just give me a minute to set this up. Okay, cool. My name is Zainab Ahmad, and today I will be talking about childhood trauma, the prevention and treatment policies for New York public schools that I think would be great to implement to help society at large. A little bit about me. I am a senior in the Macaulay Honors Program here at Hunter College. I'm studying to receive my bachelor's in social work with the Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter. I'm on the child welfare track. I'm a social work major. I'm completing the certificate in public policy here, at the Roosevelt House, um, with a concentration in social welfare. And I'm also double minoring in psychology and sociology. As you can see from what I study, I greatly care about this topic and excited to share what I know. So to start, I have a roadmap of where this presentation will go. We'll start with defining what is childhood trauma? Why does it matter? What is already being done about it? How can we progress further? Funding and limitations, and then we'll end off with hope for the future. So to start, childhood trauma, what is it? Childhood trauma is defined as the real or imagined threat to one's well-being and a way to measure childhood trauma is through adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. These are many different things that can include a range of experiences um, that might be neglect, abandonment, sexual abuse, physical abuse, witnessing abuse of a sibling or parent, or having a mentally ill parent or caregiver, depending on what kind of home life you grew up in. I have a chart here of different types. And these are not the only types, but these are just a couple to give you some understanding. Um, abuse, neglect, household dysfunction, physical, emotional, sexual, mental illness, incarcerated family members, divorce, violence, substance abuse. There's a range of different things that these can be, but having multiple of these can also greatly impact young children, especially with their development. Research in 2018 found 680,000 cases of child maltreatment, 4 million reported suspected maltreatment, along with data from Child Protective Services agencies. One in eight children experience substantiated maltreatment by age 18. There's a lot of data and research and statistics out there to show thousands of cases of maltreatment, suspected abuse and neglect, and we don't even know how many are unreported. Why does this matter? This specifically matters to me because of how much childhood trauma has effect on the brain for young children who are developing. Research shows that it causes delays in learning. And the important part of this for me is how inequitable this creates the experience for a student's education system. If you're being tested in the same way with another student who does not have that same learning delay because of your own childhood trauma, it's just unfair to be tested in the same way as others. We see with other instances of learning disabilities, children have increased amount of time for exams, papers, tests, in order to make up for that gap. And I think that this should be seen as well for children with multiple adverse childhood experiences. So my research question is, how can New York City public schools 
prevent and help treat early childhood trauma and create a more equitable educational experience for all students. So let's talk about what's being done first. We see trauma-informed positive education or TIP, which is working to do three main things, which is increasing the self-regulation of students' stress response. So we see with children with childhood trauma, their body, their bodily responses with anxiety, depression, stress, just their stressful responses can really hinder them from their schooling and academic performance, as well as their just lived experience overall, which also affects their relational capacities and the way that they're able to interact with their peers and teachers. And TIP kind of helps work to create greater bonds for these students, as well as increasing psychological resources for the students' well-being. And what exactly this is and what it's being done is it's a way for teachers to be trained to empower students and use positive education to help them and ask more questions of why and like how they can be a support system instead of punishing students who may be acting out because of things that they might be experiencing at home due to whatever childhood trauma they might be experiencing. This was done over 11 year time period um, and we see that the findings after the, the teachers were taught to incorporate this was that children were greatly able to handle heated and difficult emotions and they saw greater academic results and participation in school. So not only do we see the social emotional increase, but also academic performance, which is a great measure. How can we progress further? So I have three policies listed here that I think would be really great to incorporate in New York City public schools. The first being trauma informed and social emotional learning. The next is mindfulness and then critical race theory. We'll go into each one individually now. So trauma informed and social emotional learning, I think would be a great way for the Department of Education to reform New York City public schools by incorporating this as, along with TIP, the trauma informed positive education to just have teachers be aware of the environment that they're creating in New York City public schools to empower students to be recognizing signs of early childhood trauma, creating initiatives of 15 minutes for counselors to meet individually with students in order to speak about their difficult heated emotions that they may be unable to process at such young ages, as well as work to create an equitable education system overall. And I think that this would be a really great way to start. Mindfulness is a really amazing technique and tool as a social work student. This is something we've been learning from the beginning to de-stress and regulate our own, but also a child's emotions would just be really beneficial. It will help. There's research that really um, shows lower rates of anxiety and depression after individuals use mindfulness. Um, I personally had this in my high school, a teacher incorporated this and it greatly impacted me. So I know this firsthand and I think this would be a really great technique and policy. And critical race theory, similar to what one of my peers was talking about earlier today, Lauren, about the school to prison pipeline, we see a lot of childhood trauma come up from racism embedded in our society, culture overall, but also in the educational system. Being incorporating critical race theory into the New York City public school education system would be a really great way for us to first acknowledge what's happening and work to break the cycle of students being fed into the juvenile prison system and have teachers mindful and aware of creating a safe positive welcoming environment for all students as we see like um, disproportionate rates of people of uh, students of color being high rates of detention expulsion suspension lower grades of graduation and i think incorporating this into the curriculum would be a really good a really great way to help fight that Overall, I'm really trying to push for equitable education. We know CUNY systems are a great um, system of upward mobility for students. And I think that's why this incorporating this in the education system overall would be a great way to help solve the issue of childhood trauma. We're quickly going to talk about funding and limitations. We see from New York City's Department of Education, the total budget for this school year was 38 billion. There's 19 billion from the capital budget that is meant to build new schools renovate existing schools, as well as purchase equipment. It's um, administered by New York City Schools Construction Authority. And there's a specific thing called fair student funding, which is the main source of money from school. This is all from the DOE's website. And it talks about how principals are able to use these funds. And it's dependent on amount of students and needs of those students. And I think that with the money that's being allocated specifically for reforming and helping students in these schools with 
billions of dollars, I think that some of this should really be incorporated to help this issue. And to end, I have a slide on hope for the future. I really loved this uh, research. I found that children form attachment bonds with adults outside of their family, and a teacher was the most significant adult after their parents and caregivers. We see the importance of teachers in students' lives. They're extremely powerful and beneficial and could really make a great difference in one person's life. Could be that person that makes them feel seen and heard. And I think that is not one small thing to have. So thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. First of all, I thought it was, I thought the, um talking about what the DOE is already doing and how you would implement is, is good and it's really, it's important. So thank you for including that. Second, uh, do you find evidence that CRT is being done in schools? Because it's usually, because it's usually referred to as a concept taught in doctoral programs or law schools. I know there's controversy around it now um, at a at the sort of elementary school level or, or junior high school. But do you find that that's being done in New York or other places? That's a really good question. I did not know about it until I came to college and I've been in New York my whole life. So I, once learning about it, I think it really changed the way that I saw my, the education system and my place in it. And the reason I'm pushing for it to be a New York City or New York, yeah, New York City policy reform for, I think, earlier education, which, as you said, may be controversial. I think it is important. I believe racism is learned. And I think if we had teachers showing young children from the beginning of their educational experience that what how they should be interacting with their peers and teachers specifically being taught and um, like regulated and creating safe environments for students. Like if maybe teachers don't know that these statistics are out there about children of color and how they're disproportionately being targeted. So if they were, and if the school was pushing for that to be something that they really do not want to have, I think I don't see how that wouldn't be like an, a, a great improvement in trying to break this cycle of the school to prison pipeline, as well as eliminating decreasing childhood trauma experiences for students in schools. So I would suggest, if not just for the final paper, but as you investigate this further, further, it may not be CRT exactly, mm -hmm. but there might be some, there might be a curriculum out there that's called something else that is yeah. tailored more toward a younger, uh, early childhood education that Uh-oh. does exactly what you yeah. want it to do, but it may not be CRT exactly. So I just see, yeah. keep that in mind. Totally. All right, Thank good you. deal. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Gray. I'm a senior at Hunter College studying psychology with minors in public policy and sociology. And for today, we're going to be talking about investing in people, not in why does it look like that? Oh, it's supposed to look like that. Investing in people and not in jails, a multi pronged approach to address recidivism rates upon the closure of Rikers Island. Now, in order to talk about this topic at its length, we should also give it some historical context as it relates to incarceration. Now, incarceration within the United States first started as a rehabilitative approach to prisoners and their offenses. However, that quickly transfigured itself to one that was more punitive, centered on punishment, and that has translated to relevant policy. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about what happened in 1970 and why this was so unique. President Nixon declared a war on drugs and this really start, started an uptick in mass incarceration. From there, we saw relevant sentencing policy being enacted. We saw restricted policy on uh, low level drug, drug offenses. And that has transfigured three presidential administrations, uh, Nixon, Reagan, and then Bill Clinton. And it really propelled the philosophies that really uh, established a carceral system at its length ones that were centered on punishment rather than rehabilitation. So because of which we saw incarceration rates in a uh, spike in the United States. And we understand that once someone enters into the carceral system, it already predisposes them to a likelihood to return to the carceral system. That concept is known as recidivism, given the tendency to relapse into criminal behavior after an original offense. 
Now the graph that I have here shows that the more people recidivate, the more likely they are to not only spend more time in prison, but to continue recidivating and returning to prison. Another thing that we also uh, acknowledge in the data was that higher recidivism rates can be seen among those uh, across different social conditions. So people that have been predisposed to not have access to uh, certain education levels, particularly high school diplomas, or the access to uh, adequate, stable employment and housing. And recidivism at large was, was attempted to be uh, researched by the Federal Prison Industries Program established in 1934 by Congress. And basically this program was placing incarcerated people in the workforce and researchers would, would see whether or not recidivism rates would change in theory. Because what happened afterwards was that the Bureau of Prisons, the large, the large agency uh, used to track these statistics, largely misrepresented the data. Actually, they used data from the 1980s in order to make assumptions about recidivism rates that were happening within federal prisons. So we have a very misconstrued idea of how even preliminary social programs uh, have on the impact of recidivism rates in the United States. Now, this brings us to the present day, talking about Rikers Island. Now, Rikers Island serves as a 400 acre, 10 uh, facility jail complex sitting between the Bronx and Queens. And since its inception, there have been a lot of conversations to close it, but it, was, it took until uh, 2016 for Mayor de Blasio to implement the smaller, safer, fairer roadmap to closing Rikers Island. And generally this program was to close Rikers Island by 2026, open up four community-based jails within New York City, and also allocate some funds for relevant social programs uh, in its wake. Is this is an 18 point agenda. So I'm just gonna talk about three of these points. Community alternatives to jail sentences less than 30 days. Preventing future returns to jail through expanded programming and reentry planning and a relevant jails and jobs pipeline program. Now this was used in order to address the social conditions that was happening at the island, the vast overcrowding, the infighting, the sexual assault, and the 15 deaths this year that happened at the island. Now, because this policy has yet to be implemented, it has now been set back two years uh, to the start of its implementation a lot of questions have been surrounding whether or not this will be effective in reducing recidivism within New York State and also as it relates to recidivism in the United States. So I argue that the Blasio's policy framework to close Rikers Island will not work to reduce recidivism for two reasons. First off, this is a $3.16 billion budget to build these uh, jails within New York City, yet only $90 million uh, was allocated for these social programs. Now, as of last year, even that budget was cut, uh, uh, even that budget was cut by $500 million. So we can already see that there is a lack of incentive or a potential lack of incentive to fund the programs needed in order to effectively uh, introduce uh, formerly incarcer incarcerated people back into society. Because when you're scaling back in the hundreds of millions of dollars and from these programs, you're not just talking about taking a different paint off the wall. You also have to figure out where are where is this money being reallocated, right? The second the second reason as to why I believe it will not work is because a framework that continues to use prisons in the purview of its implementation will always require a prison population. As we saw with the introduction of the carceral system in the United States, it will always be uh, its incentive to punish people at its greatest extent rather than rehabilitate people. The prison system in New York City would further the original philosophies that created the national prison system, that created mass incarceration, as well as its subsequent policies. And these philosophies are the ones that hyper incarcerated people in the first place without adequate re without adequate reentry back into society. So what can work? 
What we've seen across cities that resemble New York City uh, in incarceration rates, as well as uh, offenses and recidivism rates, that social programs can be really, really effective that, uh, in order to reduce recidivism. Namely, social programs that aid in someone's re-entry in society after their incarceration has an effect on the likelihood for them to return to prison. So I argue that these programs should be adequately funded, uh, funded and enforced and used by government funding so that it can be eventually, so that it can eventually be devoid of a carceral system so that these programs can work independently. Upon the closure of Rikers Island now in 2027 rather than 2026, there should be a greater emphasis on introducing these programs in New York City communities. And policymakers should center an incarcerated person's re-entry into society rather than punishing them as a primary modality to reduce recidivism here in New York City, New York State, and nationally. So for my policy proposal, I only talked about three of these social programs because these are the large uh, broad scale programs um, that have been replicated across not only the United States, but also in countries like Norway and Denmark that have proved to uh, be significant in reducing recidivism, namely GED and trade skill programs, employee pipeline programs, as well as permanent housing placement programs. Now, the future implications of this study of, of this study is long and uh, long winded, namely because this this uh, policy framework has yet to be, be implemented. Like I said before, it has already been pushed back two years. So it's already coming into question whether or not policymakers are truly centering people's reentry into society. So it, uh, allowing this can also open up conversation on how one's environment can predispose them to an introduction into the carceral system. Namely, so certain social determinants can also be looked at for future implications, poverty, mental health, the school to prison pipeline that has been mentioned earlier. Now, I also wanna address this one statistic that I have here um, by the Pew Research Center that's finally showing a, a downtrend in incarcer rate, incarceration rates. Now, has this been the result of policymaking has it been the result of the current incar uh, incarceration tactics? Well, we don't know, but we do know that less people are being incarcerated. So there has to be a larger conversation on how the functionality of prisons will change from here on, uh, here on forward. And also this allows us to reimagine what prisons should be, even if we should, and what prison should be if we should have them at all in order to re eliminate recidivism in its totality. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so first of all, I really liked your proposal. I just Thank had... Um, some comments and questions. So many times people go back into the system because they are provided with food, housing and stuff like that. Um, so my question is like, um, like your proposal is like great, but it's like, who, like how would you determine who are provided? Like what kind of crimes would be like, okay for them to be a part of these programs? I think it's I think it's important to understand the implementation of uh, these programs kind of broad brushed because at the end of the day, these are people and these are people worthy of the necessary inalienable rights that um, anyone else that have not offended or have not entered the prison system. Um, uh, kind of are, are afforded so understanding how I think this is also a question of like how this is going to be enforced. Because a lot of these programs that I'm talking about are privatized, so they're able to kind of set those boundaries. But however, I'm uh, asking for more of a government oversight on these programs, and that's that's a question whether or not um, certain of offenses uh, will be excluded. Um, that's a question for uh, the stakeholders uh, within the prison system. If that makes sense. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, that does. Thanks. Okay, coffee. Yeah. 
that our Rhodes Scholar back there? It is. Yes. Hi. Um, so thanks so much for the incredible presentation. So I was wondering, can you speak a little bit more about um, the borough-based jail proposal? Um, and I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more about what you think the pathway is to sort of build the political will um, to have people understand that those borough-based jails may not be as effective as the social programs that you're um, sort of like talking about in, in the presentation. I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you. 100%. There has definitely been already discourse over whether or not these community-based jails will have an effect on the relevant communities. Now, as, as it currently stands, this policy was made to uh, just have community-based jails that would only amount to 3,300 incarcerated individuals in total. However, people from these communities are worried that there's gonna be a sense of overcrowding with, with these, um, from these jails. So creating the, uh, creating the political will also has to stem from whether or not the policy itself is viable. Um, and a lot of people from, especially I was just reading an article um, for my capstone, uh, particularly from Manhattan, uh, a lot of people are expressing a lot of concerns over whether or not this 3,300 number from the 9,000 that reside at Rikers Island would increase within a really short amount of time. Yeah. Anything? Um, I think my question is sort of a combination of both of those um, and I and, and it's really more so about just being clear about the the where you're headed in the research and the policy recommendations are the on the are the recommendations to reduce recidivism um, regardless of whether or not Rikers closes or is the closing of Rikers and the reopening of borough based jails part of that proposal yeah so the propo the proposal includes closing rikers island and not opening these uh, borough based jails but really in, in, uh, having an emphasis on these broad scope social programs within new york city so how would so what so nothing would open in its place yeah okay yeah and i think that's what your the, the political feasibility of that yeah okay all right got it thank you any other questions oh we got you up there a long time, bro. Okay, no oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so where would prisoners who maybe aren't able to return back to society who have committed more, what's the word, like heinous crimes, where would yeah. those prisoners go to other prisons, maybe upstate or something? Or? Yeah. So I think I think uh, one thing about this policy to open uh, for community community based jails should not be a long term thing and that uh, in effect, for uh, more of these heinous crimes, we should have these broad scope policies that addresses um, their own rehabilitation in a, in a safer manner, rather than just popping up prisons uh, throughout the city. Because one thing that we've seen is that prisons do not, uh, largely do not deter from these crimes happening again. So if we were to fund uh, uh, focused programs that allow for their rehabilitation, um, in the future, especially past this 10 year plan that de Blasio has planned, then that can really allow for um, a safe re-entry for even those people. Yeah, so you're saying opening new prisons is not the solution? Opening new prisons is not the solution. Yeah. Okay, great. I would just add in your, in, in your paper, um, some mention of the political ramifications of the proposal and or how you would navigate the polit the, the current politics particularly when you have um there's there was a push for bail reform and now folks are like should we have had bail reform right um and we got a mayor who ran on actually you know being a crime fighter and so how do those two things, you don't have to answer it now, but in your in your paper, like how do those two things, how does what you're saying and where the city might be moving, how do those two things work together? Kind of complete. So, yeah, so it's just something to consider. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Margaret. I go by Maggie um, and I'm 
a senior at Hunter. I am a political science major. I'm getting my minor in public policy, and I also have a minor in English. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, navigating the New York City public school system, especially during the current late stage of the pandemic as a disabled student. And personally, this topic is very personal to me because I have kind of witnessed this as a family member of a disabled student currently in the public school system. So first, I'm just going to start off with my research question. So I'm just asking how did existing shortcomings of policy that were already in place to protect disabled school children worsen post pandemic access to K 12 education and what alternatives to current options might best rectify that. So um, just to kind of give a little background to the problem. So the frenzied state of K 12 education in response to the COVID pandemic kind of threw a very big wrench into access to academic support and to resources and facilities for disabled children across the city and the entire country and kind of rush switches between back and forth from remote and in-person and, and hybrid learning, as well as kind of increasingly negligent attitudes towards precautions, such as the relaxation of mask mandates or vaccination requirements, kind of rendered an already problematic system um, fairly unfeasible for a lot of disabled students. And so I've, um, first, I'm going to look a little bit at pre-COVID sociology and personal stories, as well as um, kind of the detrimental concept of normalcy, which results in the ostracization of children from youth due to their existence outside of this ableist concept. And so first, I'm just looking at the pre-COVID legal framework that already existed. So disabled students are entitled to accommodations and resources under um, laws such as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA which protects disabled children's rights to equal opportunity and an education and that takes their needs which takes their needs into consideration. So the six pillars would include an IEP, um, free and appropriate public education, in a least restrictive environment, appropriate evaluation, parent and teacher participation and procedural safeguards. And um, protection also comes from the ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, Title One and Title One, Title Two, and Title Three um, directly prohibit discrimination by educational institutions against those with physical and intellectual disabilities. And institutions are also responsible for reasonable accommodations to that student's needs. And finally, the New York City Department of Education um, guarantees due process for parents, guardians, and families of disabled students. Uh, so, parents and guardians have the right to advocate for on behalf of their children and ensure that their rights are being met adequately and guardians have the right to be fully informed, including the translation and participation in IEP meetings. And also, according to the DOE itself, um, over 20% of New York City public school students have an IEP or, and use IEP services in some sense, which translates to over 200,000 children. And so first I looked into um, a case study of the case of charter schools in the pre 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 COVID world. And so essentially charter schools are founded on the idea of school choice and under the law, disabled students should be entitled to the same choice. But nevertheless, this charter schools were notorious pre COVID for a lack of accountability and a lack of resources to make actual broad access a reality. So many charters are run in older buildings, for example, many charters are run in older buildings with limited staff and, and which are already inaccessible by default under the assumption that accommodations can just be made when a student enrolls, which is rendered impossible later. Um, I've also personally witnessed the constrained substitute for um, physical therapy services um, with the onsite, onsite of remote learning. So um, example of physical therapy, disabled students are basically kind of have to do what they can from a couch or a chair at home. But conversely, a rush move back to full in person learning would also overlook a disabled child because without a vaccine mandate or a mask mandate and without required contact tracing for students and teachers who test positive, rushing back to school could literally be deadly for a lot of high risk patients. And um, the DOE has kind of made superficial promises to pledge 251 million to special education this current school year, but yet there is a large coalition of students currently filing a lawsuit for at least more access to compensatory education to supplement the very bare bones education that they've been receiving remotely. Um, sorry, switch too soon. Um, and it's also pretty well understood that remote learning has had a especially detrimental impact on low income and immigrant families of color due to language barriers or technology access. And this hindrance was multiplied 
on disabled students who were in um, such families who were also put in the position of basically having to advocate for um, the services they're supposed to be entitled to. And also, uh, now I'm just going to go through kind of what I found. So in the 2020 to 21 school year, 24% um, of students who receive IEPs, which translates to about 48,000 kids, did not receive the full extent of the IEP. And then 4% of those kids, um, which translates to about 8,000 children, received nothing at all. Um, this is mostly due to the limitations of remote learning, which minimize kind of the full service of IEPs. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so due to kind of how accommodations exist right now, um, disabled public stu school students will be disadvantaged indefinitely as long as the pandemic rages, which we already see the effects of in the 27% decrease in IEP enrollment in the past year. I also quickly just want to go over stakeholders. So beyond the kind of obvious populations of like disabled students um, and teachers unions who occupy and teachers, teachers unions also occupy a precarious position here. So individual educators are kind of forced to pick up the slack of the failures of IEPs. And it's essentially inherent that teachers are now kind of forced to work overtime just to meet students where they are. Even then circumstances are kind of inadequate. So um, statistical evidence is kind of not the best indication of the impacts of the pandemic as of yet, just because we're still in it. But if it is any indication, disabled children may be a demographic that takes kind of the brunt of long-term damage of the pandemic. And we've already seen kind of a downturn in IEP enrollment, as I said, and continuing this trend might result in major academic struggles. So relaxation of mask mandates on top of this quick suspension of remote learning may further leave disabled and high-risk students ignored. <laughs> and um, so currently, for I propose in the immediate future, it's not sustainable to continue to relax mask mandates at the current rate, even as vaccination rates increase. Many physically disabled students who are high risk cannot become vaccinated, and an unmasked, even an unmasked vaccinated student could very well risk their health. So in order to receive the full extent of their IEPs, I also suggest maybe a gradual and controlled return to in-person learning, perhaps a small amount of time per week at first. And also in the long term, a remote, I kind of propose the implementation of a long term remote education plan that does engage students with real life teachers and kind of simulates real life education as much as possible. And IEPs should be rewritten and reoriented and has to kind of take into account the unforeseen circumstances and student progress. And beyond that, parent engagement has to be facilitated, perhaps by allowing remote attendance to IEP meetings. And yes, thank you. Um, I <laughs> Hi, I think it was a really great presentation. Thank you for sharing with us. I um, work at a school with children with disabilities that are brain-based brain, uh, brain disorders and injuries. I learned about IEPs and everything by working there. Um, when you were talking about parents advocating and the due process and what their children or, you know, what students with disabilities are, you know, offered or can have, what do you think about parents and caregivers who may not be aware of all of the things that they like are supposed to be having what you know their IEPs are saying like language barriers or just that unawareness how can we like work to fix that so parents know their rights and what or mm -hmm. caregivers and individuals know what their student yeah. you know and I definitely think that's a big part of kind of revamping and strengthening parent involvement in <coughs> IEPs. So perhaps I would propose maybe because translation is people are entitled to translation services, for example, during an IEP meeting, perhaps I would suggest like a translation service at perhaps, at the, for example, at the beginning of the year, like a kind of quick rundown of what exactly a student is entitled to, because as you say, it is very, it is a major issue. And um, this should be and is a integral part of the parent and guardian involvement in an IEP that they're technically entitled to. Hi. So um, both my parents are special ed teachers. Uh, and so I saw like what the horror of remote learning and how hard it was. 
but I also know how difficult IEPs can be with like a huge class of students. So I think you said part of your policy would be um, uh, expanding IEPs to take into account remote learning. Would this place like the onus of like the additional work of those IEPs on the teachers or would there be added services to help them out with that burden, I guess? Sure, yeah, so um, my proposal would really take into account an added service because um, I did take note during the pandemic, there were, for example, private schools and contractors who essentially, like I remember my younger sister actually went to Catholic school. And so there were, in the Catholic school system, there was like essentially a private school formed itself as a fully remote thing so that students could um, basically be enrolled remote and still be in school. So um, I would kind of suggest something vaguely similar in the sense that an IEP could be rewritten and reoriented specifically remote focused because a lot of remote learning right now is essentially what it's supposed to be for a temporary medical leave like an injury. So a lot of it's written right now as if it's short term and it's not really engaging a teacher or, any, or really a real life person at all. So I would, so when I suggest rewriting of IEPs, I do mean like a new service involving a real, a real specific teacher and education focused more on the long term rather than like a short term as it is right now. Um, I just two very quick things. It was really well done. So thank you, thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't know that you did this. Could you define IEP? Oh sure. <laughs> I know what it is, and I know that folks do, but in case they don't, and just really for the purpose of a presentation, right. you should uh, define it. Okay, right. So an IEP would stands for an individualized education program, which is essentially a plan for for a given school year or any projected amount of time, but usually a school year for the essentially a learning plan that takes into account a student's um, personal disabilities and, and limitations. And that is done in conjunction with who's part of that plan? Um, which would include, uh, usually they have a specific IEP educator as well as educators like the teachers that the student would have and the student's family. Okay. So just make sure that you um, specify that, right? And but it, that also brings to the other point: those seven, uh, six pillars that you mm -hmm. talked about. You don't have to do it now, but for the purposes of the paper, for the final document, just whatever IDEA and ADA specify mm -hmm. in the law. Talk about what is legal, what is codified in the law versus you know something that's been done through policy. In right. other words, it's important to know what the law says must happen. Mm -hmm. All right, so just include that. All right, well done. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Olenka Bolina, and the title of my project is Ending the Digital Divide in New York City, uh, Addressing the Racial Disparities in NYPD's Surveillance Technology. So first, a little bit about myself. I'm a senior majoring in English literature and pursuing the public policy certificate with a minor in legal studies. So my concentration in my public policy certificate is media policy. So I was very interested coming into this capstone course uh, evol in, in examining evolving technology policy and how it's impacting New Yorkers. So first, for the background of the problem, so over the past decade, the NYPD has purchased and implemented a militarized range of surveillance tools with no real regulations or public oversight. This presents a significant privacy and civil rights issue because not only does this infringe on New Yorkers' basic rights to privacy, but it also inevitably targets and criminalizes BIPOC New Yorkers due to the racially disparate impact of these surveillance tools. So, Beyond the historical over-surveillance of communities of color, these tools themselves have racially biased algorithms that fuel biased and broken policing. My project analyzes the implications of mass, of mass police digital surveillance through a racial lens, answering the following two key questions. How does the NYPD's usage of advanced surveillance tools target and further criminalize BIPOC communities? And how do such surveillance tools employed by the NYPD amplify discrimination and racial disparities within the city's housing, criminal, and immigration systems? So within my project, there's three primary stakeholders. The first one is the New York City Police Department, which represents an organization meant to uphold public safety in one of the busiest cities in the world. 
especially after 9-11, it makes sense that as an entity, they want to implement and invest in tools that could increase public safety. However, they have been very vocal in their opposition to any sort of regulating legislation out of fear that it could somehow facilitate terrorist attacks. But there is a sort of concern here of security versus liberty, and that's kind of at the center of my project. Uh, the second stakeholder group is the BIPOC and immigrant communities, which are basically referring to the vulnerable and over-policed New Yorkers, such as the populations that are going to be most directly impacted by the usage of these surveillance tools. So the third stakeholder would be the New York City Council and city legislators, who as an entity, they have addressed the NYPD usage of advanced surveillance tools, specifically through the PAST POST Act, which stands for the Public Oversight of Surveillance Technology Act, and this legislation actually serves as my first unit of analysis in my study. So originally passed in June of 2020, this bill obligates the NYPD to publicly share information about its surveillance tools and any protective regulations they have in place if they exist. It specifically requires the NYPD to draft surveillance impact and use reports and policies for each of its surveillance tools. However, in January of 2021, the NYPD released their first round of their surveillance impact and use reports, which reveals that they complied with the bare minimum, creating a false sense of transparency. All of their reports failed to address if, this, if these tools had a racially disproportionate impact on protected groups, and it lacked crucial information about who can access and utilize the data collected by NYPD surveillance tools. So the NYPD's reports failed to acknowledge the racial and gender bias that are embedded in these surveillance tools. Their policy regarding their facial recognition software does not address the higher error rates that facial recognition technology has when identifying people of color. In particular, the NYPD's facial identification system is based on racially skewed data sets, which their reports make no mention of, such as police arrest photos, which have a disproportionate presence of black and brown communities, and historical NYPD data that may be tainted by its unconstitutional stop and frisk program. So this image is from uh, an MIT research study on a facial recognition software. And so on the top left, we have white males who are least likely to, mis to be misidentified by facial recognition software. Their gender was misidentified in only 1% of these white males versus the bottom right corner, which represents the group of people most vulnerable for misidentification by facial recognition software, which happens to be uh, black women with error rates up to 35%. So this study in particular reveals the racial and gender disparities in facial recognition technology as white men are least likely to be misidentified versus black women who are most likely to be misidentified. And it's important to note that this is in context of law enforcement usage. So misidentification by facial recognition software could easily result in a false arrest or just unwarranted police investigations. The NYPD reports also failed to address how their gang databases criminalizes communities of color. So the NYPD gang database is essentially a secret list and database used to monitor and target those that the NYPD labels as gang members based on arbitrary reasons, such as social media posts that include a hashtag or a style and color of a clothing article. The NYPD report does not address that 99% of the individuals in this database are non-white. Alarmingly, the gang database criminalizes youth, monitoring children as young as 12 years old through informants such as police officers, also known as school resource officers in school, who are trained to spot warning signs of gang activity. So this image is actually taken from a training handbook that school police officers are given. Warning signs that could place a student on this database are as arbitrary and broad as changes in behavior and tattoos and signs. So not only does this gang database facilitate the school to prison pipeline, but it also amplifies the disparities in public housing and immigration systems. So the individuals added to gang databases are never notified that they're being placed on this database, but yet they're also receiving a gang associated label in policing systems that follow them forever. 
So this gang la label has severely harsh consequences, and on this graphic that you can see on the screen, it kind of shows the different ways that you can be inputted and placed on the database and the results that it could have afterwards. So I just mentioned the school resource officers, so let's say that you have some sort of warning sign, an unexplained signal of wealth, which could just be like an expensive backpack. Um, you're placed on this database, and then all of a sudden later on your family applies to public housing or you apply to public housing. And this label is following you, so you're denied access to the public housing. Public housing is also a unique complex of this situation because gang policing in New York City is primarily focused in public housing areas of the city. So meaning that you live there, you're already vulnerable to housing segregation and police over surveillance. And you might just be placed on this database simply because you live there. So on the graphic, you can actually see, I, don't, I know it's in black and white, so I don't know if it's like that clear, but if you're hanging out in your neighborhood, you can simply, and if that neighborhood happens to be a gang hotspot, you can be pl placed on this database. There's also the unique and very dangerous intersection with immigration systems because judges across the nation have been known to kind of remove the benefits from, immigra from immigrants or kind of put them um, on awareness to be deported just because they have this gang label on their file. Meanwhile, they not, they're not aware that they have this gang label until they're notified by a judge and there's kind of nothing they can do about it at that point. And in addition to that, the relationship between NYPD and ICE has not been disclosed. The NYPD refuses to kind of talk about their relationship in any of their draft use and impact reports. So in order to address the racial disparities within the NYPD usage of surveillance tools, I propose a threefold call to action. So first, I argue that the NYPD gang database should be abolished completely. There has already been a New York City Council bill uh, introduced by the Committee on Public Safety uh, that would it has been introduced but not passed. It would basically alert the minors on the gang database that they're on the database and give them the opportunity to appeal their placement. Um, but I'm arguing for the revision of this bill to kind of just get rid of the gang database completely because what it does is that it harshly criminalizes our city's youth, immigrant, and BIPOC communities without a real legal basis. Uh, my second aspect of my call to action would be extending and building upon the POST Act. So the POST Act was definitely meant to uh, achieve transparency, which the NYPD has kind of failed to comply with. So I think we can, ex we can kind of fix this by establishing stricter standards that the NYPD's use and impact reports have to abide by. So I'm proposing a racial impact standard that addresses the, dis the disparate impact of every surveillance tool that the NYPD employs. So for example, this would look like if they drafted a use and impact report on their facial recognition technology, but they fail to acknowledge their usage of racially skewed data sets, the report is then deemed invalid and the NYPD must stop employing this technology immediately. Um, the third aspect is kind of a more long-term goal, but it would be the push for the Facial Recognition and Biometric Technology Moratorium Act of 2021. So this has actually been introduced in the Senate, and what it would do is that it would prohibit biometric surveillance by federal government without uh, authorization. But more importantly, it would withhold uh, certain federal funding from state and local governments that employ biometric surveillance. So what this would do is that it would actually encourage NYPD along with other city uh, law enforcement agencies to limit and uphold regulations that have been placed on this uh, biometric surveillance tools. Uh, so further policy solutions and recommendations. So I'm arguing for the implementation of routine federal studies to promote accountability on local police levels. So basically what this would look like is, for example, there's a federal institution called the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And what they would do under this uh, suggestion is that they would conduct extensive studies and research on biometric surveillance tools used by police across the nation every two years. And it's important that it be every two years because this technology is constantly evolving and it needs to be kept up with. Um, and basically, it would work with these local law enforcement agencies to improve or rectify however they're using these surveillance tools. Um, the second one is definitely a little bit more broad, but it has to do with the restructuring and publication of NYPD funding. So since 2007, the NYPD has spent over $159 million on surveillance tools through a private and unapproved fund called the Special Expenses Fund. So if these 
if tax dollars are being spent to kind of support this fund, then this fund needs to be made public so that city lawmakers and also just city residents know how their money is being used to empower military grade surveillance. And this would also involve uh, releasing unredacted NYPD contracts with surveillance and biometric companies, because so far what the information that the NYPD has released has been through FOIL requests through nonprofit organizations, not necessarily because they're willingly posting it on their website. And so a lot of the documents they have released are heavily redacted, which doesn't really allow policymakers or the public to kind of piece together how they're using all these thousands of surveillance cameras with facial recognition technology in addition to the gang database. It's all kind of separate and no one knows how exactly it's being funded or how they're being used together and who exactly is being allowed to access this data. So why is this urgent? So New York City's existence as a safe haven for vulnerable groups and immigrant communities is under attack with the usage of this technology without any real and efficient public uh, regulation and oversight. So the diverse populations of New York City must be protected and empowered rather than criminalized. Um, and in addition to this, NYPD and policy leaders must understand and thoroughly address the racial implications of surveillance technologies in order to prevent the further targeting and unjust criminalization of already vulnerable communities. And I just want to go back to my slide here. Um, I just wanted to point out in connection to a lot of the conversations that my peers have brought up, um, this NYPD revision budget would kind of involve the divestment from surveillance tools and investment into social inclusion strategies. So the NYPD gang database, for instance, is kind of meant to prevent or address street crime with military grade surveillance tools. So instead of you know using so much money to fund a, a database, what we could do instead is focus on social inclusion strategies, which would put the youth in these communities at the center of policy making that is going on in their neighborhoods, in addition to community based policing um, or just socially community based policing, as a lot of my peers have mentioned, which really involve social workers. Um, actual sustainable mental health counseling and also alternative kind of methods to uh, justice such as restorative justice. So with that, um, I just want to say that the transparency that the Post Act was meant to achieve, I still believe in it. I think it can be possible. I think we just need to push the NYPD in the right direction. And thank you. I'll just say, um, enjoyed the presentation. Um, I especially like that you use something from class security versus liberty. Thank you for including me. <laughs> Someone does listen to me. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm joking. I know y'all listen to me. I'm sorry. I'm joking. It was a joke. It was a joke. I know y'all listen to me. Um, the, uh, the, the only question I, I had really was on, because I, I think you said it, you may have said it, and it probably is implied in what you've in what you've done. I mean, does this affect a particular age group? Right. So I would say that the NYPD gang database in particular is targeting youth of color. Um, so 30% of 20,000 individuals added to the database between 2003 and 2013 were children. There's children as young as 12 years old here. Um, and again, these children have no idea that they're placed on the database. And I think also with the focus on public housing communities, it kind of just enables um, police tracking and kind of a school to prison pipeline as well, because they basically have the police monitoring them from um, such a young age. So I would say that the community that's maybe like, I wouldn't say most at harm, but especially at harm at a disproportionate rate is the youth of New York City. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, yeah, no, it does. Um, I was, I didn't know if there was, and perhaps there is like a specific age range. Only mm -hmm. one of the reasons I asked, if we had two semesters of this, I would be curious about how that dovetails with Stephen's work, because does this increase recidivism and how, uh, well, how it impacts right. recidivism rates, right? If you're constantly on their radar, mm -hmm. right? Like, is somebody being harassed or not stopping first because we technically don't do that anymore but you know what i mean like is you know how this feeds into recidivism i actually would that would be interesting you know 
Uh, definitely. And also just like in kind of relation to that, um, I didn't say it because I just have a lot of information on my slides and I had to condense it for the purposes of this presentation. But the gang label, um, what it does for youth with like minor kind like minor misdemeanors is that if they have this gang label and the judge sees it, they can kind of they have the freedom to assign a much harsher uh, consequence and a much harsher a much harsher sentence. And again, like it could be a minor dis misdemeanor and they don't know that they have this gang label on them. Them. There was a council bill to kind of address that, but I think we just need to go bigger and kind of get rid of the database in general. Okay. Oh, one question in the back. Mike is coming. A Mike is coming. Peter is bringing Mike. Uh, so sorry, I just thought of a question. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, um, you talked about the gang database and how it was proved or the findings showed that it wasn't effective, you know, stop and frisk wasn't effective, mm -hmm. you know, the Muslim surveillance program as well that the NYPD was responsible for, you know, that targeted even CUNY and Hunter College and John Jay and different Muslim student associations that also wasn't found to be effective. So time and time again, you know, we're seeing these instances of like misuse of surveillance funding. So I'm wondering, like, um, can you talk a little bit more about if there's a pathway to not only like, you know, the post stack to increase transparency, but is there a way to hold accountable institutions or like the NYPD or mm. like affiliates um, for taking part in allowing sort of the mistakes that have already happened? And then do you think that this could be the basis of, you know, maybe not the larger defund conversation, but defunding the surveillance technology because it, it's time and time from, from the presentation been proven and not to work. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about like the pathway to not only like address the the surveillance like misuse, mm -hmm. but sort of what does punishing or like uh, like holding accountable institutions look like? Right. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think. Well, I think also something I wanted to that came into my mind as you were talking is that I think in conversations lately with uh, policing and defunding the police, there's the argument that somehow these surveillance tools are like more accurate um, or that they get rid of the racially biased perspective, which obviously um, I don't think is true. And I think the data proves otherwise because often what it does is just amplifies it. And then it's uh, done and paired with bias, already biased and broken policing. But um, I guess to kind of address like violations, like what that would look like for organizations. I think that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about it, but like for me, it kind of looks like just um, just stopping to use the technology like immediately. Uh, I know uh, the LAPD, for example, has banned their predictive policing systems. I think it's just kind of a hard question because there is such like a lack of a federal re regulation. So like, what does that look like on the local level? Like, how do we hold the NYPD accountable more than just telling them to stop using the technology? I think, you know, forcing them to draft like effective and accurate po like draft reports of who's being impacted is the first step, but definitely not the last one. Um, I think for me, like personally, I would just say like, I, I think, it, the consequences would maybe have to do with more funding. Like, how do we, clearly you're not using this money for the right reasons, so let's completely like reallocate it. I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, we're done. Um, congratulations, this was great. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of all of you and, and the work that you've done.